It's the Mixed Martial Arts Hour with... The Mixed Martial Arts Hour is back in your life on this Wednesday, September 1st, 2021. Hello again, everyone. I'm Ariel Hawani. Welcome back to the program. Another Wednesday show, baby. Rolling along here like it ain't no thing. Like we never left. I was saying to my mom, I think it was yesterday. It just kind of feels like I never left at this point, right? The show is rolling along. Big guests. Great banter. People are watching. It's like we never left. And I'm so happy to be here twice a week. I do want to let you know, off on Monday due to Labor Day. So next week, it will only be one show next Wednesday. Um, so you get a bit of a break from me because Lord knows I've been flooding the gate ever since I returned from my little hiatus. A lot going on in my life, a lot of content, a lot of people to talk to, a lot of shows to do, a lot of things to discuss. And so I am very happy to be here on this very rainy Wednesday. If you're in the Northeast, it might be raining where you are. So perhaps you can uh, sit back, relax, and enjoy a little... MMA Hour Talk. Right? Great lineup for you. Uh, later in the program, we're going to uh, do our On the Nose section of the show. Uh, this is the section where I answer some of your questions. I've been calling it Ask Me Anything. I've been calling it Inside the Nose. But my good friend, Anthony Evans... Uh, a subscriber, a loyal subscriber to my Substack page, came up with the name On The Nose, sort of like On The Record, but it's On The Nose because I am The Nose, and so it's On The Nose. Boop. And so uh, the page is up. If you want to ask some questions, you have to be a subscriber to ask. So it's a very VIP you know, community over there. Um, and I'll answer some of those at around 3.30. At 3 o'clock, I'm going to be joined by Marlon Cheeto Vera, who uh, we found out a couple of uh, days ago is going to be fighting Frankie Edgar in uh, in uh, in New York, Madison Square Garden, November 6th, um, on that pay-per-view card that's looking pretty good with the Kamar Usman, Colby Covington fight, Michael Chandler, Justin Gaethje. Big fight for Marlon Vera, Frankie Edgar fighting back in the tri-state area. So we'll talk to Cheeto, who has become one of my favorite characters in the game uh, a little later on. Um, at 2.30, we're going to have a little old uh, bearing of the hatchet session with one Aljamain Sterling, who I respect and appreciate very much for coming on the show. We'll talk about some of our issues over the past few months. In fact, I've been on a bit of a, uh, a beef squashing session, if you will, over the last few days. Happened to see a couple of people who I thought were uh, misrepresenting me in the public over the last, I don't know, 18 months, uh, some in Cleveland, some in Las Vegas the previous week. And uh, I feel like we have been successful in our attempt to squash these beefs and to let people know that uh, you can't just go around saying things about old nose without, uh, without hearing about it. Uh, speaking of which, it does feel like a apropos time to let everyone know that at least for today, not forever, I have too much respect for those who came before me, but at least for today, you are looking at the new CEO, CFO, and COO of P.F. Chang's, at least for today, one day only, just one day. Keep my name out of your mouth, Stop lying, stop spreading lies, stop making up stories. Or there'll be glass walls and stuff involved. You know what I'm saying, B? All right? Dicey, dicey to do that sort of thing. So at least for today, I want to let you all know you're looking at CEO, CEO, CFO. In any event. We'll also be joined by Eric Nixick, one of the best coaches in MMA, at uh, 2 p.m., Extreme Couture, head coach. He is the man. 
I've been wanting to have him on the show for quite some time. I'm looking forward to that. One of my favorite guests in the history of doing this show, Ray Janal. Ray Janal I. Quinta, the best real estate agent in MMA. He will join us at 1.30. But first, I'm very excited to talk to our first guest of the day. Uh, this man is quite the character, and you may have seen him on Saturday at the Apex, winning the 135-pound Ultimate Fighter finale, winning that UFC contract. He is Houston's own pretty Ricky Tercios, who beat Brady Highstand in the finale on Saturday and has turned into, very quickly, one of the most colorful and entertaining characters in the Ultimate Fighting Championship, and I'm very excited to have him on the program for the very first time. And so, without further ado, let's kick this bad boy off and go to the magic of Zoom and say hello to Pretty Ricky, who has his tough trophy right next to him there, on his right. Hello, sir, how are you? Yo, what's up, Ariel? Hey, I'm chilling over here, you know what I'm saying? Just hanging out, chopping it up with you, you know what I'm saying? Hey, look, I wanna go ahead and go on the record real quick too, hey. When people be calling me Pretty Ricky, I appreciate them for that. You know, that's one of my OG nicknames since the beginning of time. But I made the request to the UFC to announce me as Ricky Hadouken Tercios, the fighter name. You know what I mean? It ain't your fault, bro. Uh -huh. I, I tried to make the request. It, they called me Pretty Ricky on fight night. Hey, it was all good. It was a great memory I'll uh, hold on to forever, you know. But I'll go on the record now. On your on your show today, you know what I mean. Hey, for the people to know, let me be known as Ricky Hadouken Torsios. You know? Okay, noted. I will never call you Pretty Ricky ever again. Uh, tell us why the name change, why the nickname change. No, oh, hey, look, you can still call me Pretty Ricky. That's <laughs> cool. It's all good. You know what I mean. But uh, I always have the two nicknames. People call me Pretty Ricky. Uh, they call me Ricky Hadouken as well. You know, and uh, I always preferred uh, Ricky Hadouken inside the, the octagon and inside the ring as well, just because of the fact that, you know, like uh, Pretty Ricky, that's like, oh, it's the fun name, you know what I mean? People say, oh yeah, you you cool guy, whatever, dude, you know what I'm saying? But uh, inside the octagon, though, and in the ring, we're fighting, we're doing the blows, it's the blood and guts battle. And I always try to summon that dragon energy inside the fight, so that's for sure why I always chose uh, the true warrior name, Ricky Hadouken, like that, you know what I mean? I love it, and it makes total sense. Uh, you won the trophy that's right next to you over there on Saturday. So what was that, like four or five days ago? What has the last four or five days like been like for you? What the last days, couple of days been like, man, it's been, uh, it's been very cool. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm thankful I got the win on Saturday. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, man, it's a dream come true, bro. You feel me? So, like, the last couple of days, I've just been relaxing. Man, I'm sore. I'm super sore. I'm still sore right now. My neck. My back, I'm like, oh, man, we did a lot of grappling, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I've just been hanging out with my family, you know what I mean? Just chilling, um, really just kicking back. When I went back to the gym, you know what I'm saying? Just teaching my classes and stuff like that. All of the all the kids in kids' class, they were all just super excited, man. And uh, it really warms my heart to be able to um, inspire, inspire my students, you know what I'm saying? Not just the students in my small circle within uh, in my in the gym, you know what I'm saying? But as well, too, to be inspiring, uh, you know, the, the young ones throughout the world, you know what I'm saying, on the platform I was able to express myself on, you know what I mean? So uh, it's a dream come true for sure, brother. And congrats, by the way, on also getting your black belt on Saturday night. Did you know that was coming? <laughs> you know, I had no idea it was coming. I had, a, I, I kind of had like uh, some, some feelings that inspired me. The reason why is because, I mean, uh, when I had returned from the first two rounds, the isolation portion, I had been promoted to my fourth stripe on my brown belt. So the next thing that was coming was my black belt. So, I mean, uh, I just kept training hard and kept sharpening my tools, sharpening my sword, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I knew that I'd eventually be getting promoted to black belt one of these days. And I figured that, hey, like I knew as I was going into this final fight, I remember things that would inspire me. I'd be like, hey, man, I got to win this fight. If Morona promotes me, that'd be cool if he promoted me. I don't know if he was, if he wasn't, you know what I'm saying? It was a surprise. But for sure, in the back of my head, I was like, man, I got to win this fight. And if he were to do that, that would be an incredible memory. And that is what happened. You know what I mean? So I was so thankful to have been promoted inside the octagon to the rank of black belt, you know. And you know what they say? When you're a black belt, it is only the beginning. So, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it's uh, it's incredible. I'm on the journey I love for it. sure. I love it. What a great honor to get that right after uh, you know, you win that trophy. I have to say, the, the fight was fun. It was entertaining. You are entertaining. The post-fight 
interview, the promo, if you will, was fantastic. I love your energy. I love your vibe. I love your message. Why did you feel you were talking to everyone about being one and coming together and peace and love? Why did you feel the need to do that in that moment? Great question. Well, you know, um, it was going to be my first time on the camera like this. You know what I mean? There's a first, first time for everything. You know what I mean? So like the whole experience on the ultimate fighter and everything like that has been a very humbling experience. You know, I'm doing what I love, you know what I'm saying? Doing martial arts at the highest level. And, uh, you know, it, it gives me the platform to, to express myself with my art form, with the punching and the kicking and the grappling. But the whole reality show aspect was incredible too. being able to, they, they really dive deep into your, into you as a person too. being able to, you know what I mean? We're like talking on the reality show all the time and everything like that. It really creates a story. You know what I mean? Um, as I got on the post fight interview, I definitely just wanted to make sure that uh, whenever the camera was put on me in the victory, I had I had a couple of notes that I had written down within my journal and things of this nature. You know what I mean? I was like, okay, you get on the mic, you know, maybe uh, do your best to say something positive for the people. You know what I mean? So I did my best to, to deliver a, a good a good short message to something from the heart. You know what I mean? And things like, hey, you got somebody you love. Make sure you give them a hug. You know what I'm saying? You feel me on that? And then, you know, the, the message for oneness and unity and everything like that and for the peace, for the people, you know, because there could be times things could be crazy, you know what I mean? But, hey, like sports, sports, they bring people together. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Everybody loves sports. You know what I'm saying? Whatever your favorite sports may be, whether it's golf or baseball, football, basketball, mixed martial arts, whatever. And it was live on ESPN with the millions of people watching all around the world. So I figured it'd be a good opportunity to deliver a positive message through sports like this. You know what I'm saying? Uh, deliver a message to children, you know what I mean? In, uh, in, in that, and then as well, uh, you know, deliver this some, some good to the people too watching around the planet. You know what I'm saying? I love it. We need more people like you, not only in MMA, but in, in the world. You, you, uh, you are an inspiration in the way that you uh, conduct yourself and the messages that you try to put out. And then if that wasn't enough, then you get to the post-fight press conference and you start doing some karaoke for all of us. This was tremendous stuff. What, what was the song that you were singing? I forget now. I had, uh, I had sung uh, Free Bird by yes. Leonard Skinner. Yes. What, what prompted you to do that? It was amazing. Yeah, bro. Um, yeah, man. You know, what, pr what prompted me to do that? You know, hey. It was a very unique night. You only, you only, uh, you only fight on the Ultimate Fighter finale once in your life. You know what I mean? You know, inshallah, I figure I see the long UFC career ahead of me with many UFC fights to come. But you only there's a first time for everything. You only fight in the Ultimate Fighter finale one time. I knew it was gonna be a historic night for for me and all the fighters involved like this. You know, and uh, to have won the, the to have won the tournament. It was history in the making like this, you know, put me on alongside. I'm, I'm so humbled and I'm very thankful to be alongside, you know, many other great champions like Tony Ferguson, Diego Sanchez, Forrest Griffin, Michael Bisping, Nate Diaz. You know, the list goes on, you know, the great, great fighters that have won this tournament like this, you know what I mean? And uh, like it was history in the making like that. And I was like, all right, first time for everything. And I, so I practice that too. I do karaoke all the time, me and my family. And uh, that's one of my good ones off the list, you know what I mean? So I figured, hey, nobody's done that neither before you know what i mean so i was like uh, and i'm having fun bro you know what i mean like i'm in there having fun in the octagon and it's so much blood and guts so much like just uh, uh, we just we in here destroying each other inside the octagon you know what i mean so then i gotta bring balance then i gotta bring it back yes. go to the press conference i'm like let me do something something fun too you know what i'm saying more history in the making like this never I been done it. let's go by the way are, are you uh are you muslim what's up all right, great. Listen, bro. You said inshallah. Right you said inshallah, right? Yes. Yeah. You know, I say inshallah, Lord willing. You know what I mean? Yes. Primero, adios. You know what I mean? I, I would not be here without God, you know? And I tell you like this on the show too, you know, um, many of my family members, many of my uh, closest friends are, is, are, are Muslim. You know what I mean? Since we were young boys, they've always been some of the most powerful influences me, influences on me in, in my entire life. You know what I mean? Uh, my shout out to my to my to one of my bestest friends, Kaid, Kaid Al Salim. Shout out to one of my bestest friends, Fadis Al Salim. My boy Omar, you know what I'm saying. My boy Saad, and uh, you know we, we've been bestest friends since we were young boys. And I can always remember since we were since we were young boys, whenever whatever we did, you know what I mean. But chasing the dream since I was a young kid, he always told me, man, you know what I mean. And no matter what, we always remember, you know, inshallah, bro. You feel me, that? And then my grandmother always tells me the same thing as well. You know what I mean? Hey, primero adios, God first. You know what I mean? So I was always, hey, 
I always, I, uh, it, it deep in my heart, you know what I'm saying? I always uh, keep myself very close to the, to the spirit. You know what I'm saying? So this, this, this is what I say. Yes, sir. Amazing, man. Amazing. By the way, what was that little thing that you were holding? It was like when you were doing the karaoke, it was that little machine that you were holding there with the lights. What was that? Was it telling you the words? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. So I had the, uh, I, I literally just got it on, uh, like the Saturday before I left. I had just got in that microphone on Saturday. <laughs> then I thought I was doing the practice run on Sunday is when I had the idea like, Hey, you know what? I think I might sing a song at the press conference. I win, I win the, if I win the, the championship, then I'll do a song at the press conference. That'll be fun. So yeah, it was just a microphone. And then the microphone has the boom box speaker with the I lights on it. it. You know I what I'm saying? It. And then I connected, uh, then I had my, uh, my cell phone on me that had the, uh, the lyrics, you know what I mean? So I was looking at the karaoke on my cell phone and I connected it to the Bluetooth. So the Bluetooth on the speaker was playing the, the, the instrumentals. Then I was looking at my lyrics on my cell phone and then I was just singing into the light up karaoke mic with the boom box. So Amazing, it was a good man. setup. Amazing. I love <laughs> it. It was very unique, very memorable. Um, did you grow up watching the ultimate fighter? Like, was it cause you know, the ultimate fighter went away for a little bit. Was it a little surreal for you initially to be a part of this? And now perhaps is it surreal to be, you know, with that, that trophy that, as you said, has been held by many great fighters over the years. Yeah, it, it was uh, incredible. I never, I never ever imagined I would compete in the tournament. If you would have asked me, I would never have expected this. You know what I mean? Sometimes life throws you in unexpected directions. You know what I'm saying? And uh, you don't know where, where, where it's going to take you. So it, it's incredible how the journey has been like this. I was, uh, yeah, I remember I was like a little kid. I must have been like maybe 10, 11 years old. And I was watching season one of the ultimate fighter, you know, me and my mom, my dad, my little brother, Ryu, we were watching it in our little apartment, you know what I'm saying? And uh, I'd always been a UFC fan, you know, I'd watched UFC since I was a little, little kid. So I was already watching UFC, seeing, I remember seeing like, you know, when Ken Shamrock and Tito Ortiz, they had their rivalry, you know, all of Chuck's fights, you know what I mean? So old school Robbie Lawler versus, uh, versus Diaz, you know what I'm saying? Like I've been watching since I was a kid. And I remember my pops goes, hey, there's going to be a reality show for the UFC. I, I read about it in the internet or whatever. They're going to do this reality show and stuff. I was like, oh, reality TV? That's kind of cool. And then, uh, yeah, so I watched it as a young boy uh, since I was a little kid, watched the first season. I was really inspired by, uh, you know, uh, many of the fighters on there. And then uh, it's a dream come true, bro, to have been, to, have, to not only have been able to compete on the show, but obviously for the result to have gone the, the way it did. I just thank God, bro. It was, it was incredible for sure. Amazing. Uh, what about being in the house and being away from people and, and sort of cut off from reality? What was that like for you mentally? Yeah, for me mentally, that one was the, uh, that was the, the, the toughest part was the, was the cut off from, from society and the isolation, you know? So that was a very unique experience in itself. And then uh, that's something for sure like because that experience is so unique and, and wild, I'm, I'm glad it happened. It was tough when you're doing it, you know, and it, but, uh, you know, though, when, whenever you got those pressures, the pressures, they create diamonds, you know what I mean? So it's all good. And that's a, that's a, that's a thing that I will take with me forever. One of the things if I share real quick, like something that I did enjoy about the isolation, but again, it was tough was you learn about yourself. You have that alone time. You're not in there with any distractions of, oh, I got to go to Walmart, got to go to the grocery store, or I got to go walk my dog, or I got to go, go go over here to do this appointment for this or that, or I got to go to work and teach these classes and then do this thing for this person. You know what I'm saying? Like, literally, all, all I had to do was uh, focus on, uh, you know, one thing and one thing only, and it was the martial arts. That's it. All I had to focus on and a lot of meditating and just diving deep into my thoughts, writing into my journals, things of this nature. Like, what do I, what am I really about? You know, so that alone time and that you time, it was great in isolation, but then too, like, that's important for life too. You know what I'm saying? So that was something that, uh, that I really enjoyed about that. You know what I mean? So help me forever. What, what did you learn about yourself? Hmm, man, what did I learn about myself, man? Let me think real quick. I got my journal right here, too. Oh, I love I guess it. I want to, yeah. Would you like to see a couple of things? I sure. Guess, man? I would love it if you want to yeah. share. Yeah, I guess I'll share a couple of things real quick as I'm looking right here. You know what I'm saying? But, um, man, some of the things that I learned was like, okay, real quick. On a physical standpoint, you know what I'm saying? How much my body could really endure. You know what I'm saying? Like, the coaches that pushed us to the limit, 
then as well, we're pushed to the limit too in this in this world championship regiment designed by the Volkanovsky squad. Shout out to them because they were really showing us how to train like some world champion caliber fighters. Now you mix that in with, um, you know, now you mix that in with, I had to fight the first fight. And then I know 14 days later, I'm going back into the fight again. You know what I mean? So I was like, oh man. And, and then I was just like, wake up and I had the pain in my elbow and my thigh. And then we still got to go to this hard practice. You know what I'm saying? And I'm just like, holy moly. I was like, man, this is pain. I, f- I live in this pain, but hey, it's all good, man. You know, uh, you know, one of the real ones who said it, uh, Max Holloway, he had inspiration. One time he describes it as crazy town. I saw him like on the uh-huh. Roman podcast talking about crazy town or something. And it's like, oh yeah, I feel like, yeah, we, we, we packing our tickets to crazy town right now, bro. You got to be in this <laughs> state of mind right now, dude. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, oh my goodness. It was a, it was a very, very, uh, surreal feeling for sure. You know what I'm saying? Like my goodness. What what was it like? Uh, you were back at the apex because you were part of the contender series, and you lost. Um, and now you get the second chance, and now you win. Did you feel when you lost on the contender series that your dreams were over? Or did you believe that you'd be back in some way, shape, or form? Yeah, um, you know, in that moment, it was so painful. One of the most painfuls. I had to go through like that. It was more emotional pain more than anything. You know what I mean? So it's invisible, I guess. Cause it's just all good. You know what I mean? Things could be worse. You know what I mean? You, you live to fight another day. You know what I mean? It's all good, bro. You, you lose, you win some, you lose some, but you live to fight another day with these right here. So, you know, uh, I, I always had faith in myself, but for sure I had to stay tough. It was all mental fortitude for sure, bro. Because like, from losing on the contenders, you know what I'm saying? And then like um, through the ups and the downs like that, then I remember there's that, there's a gray area in my career where like somewhere in that neighborhood, I popped my kneecaps as well. You know what I mean? I popped like my left kneecap, then I popped my right kneecap too. I was like, oh Damn. man, you know what I mean? So then like, and you know, those take forever to heal. You know what I'm saying? And then like people were asking me, yo Rick, when it, when you coming back, what's going on, Rick? You know what I mean? Some of my friends even confessed to me later. They didn't tell me at the moment, but they confessed to me later. Like, yo, Rick, I thought you retired, bro. Uh-huh. I know you, uh, you know what I mean? They didn't tell me that at the moment, but later they told me. They're like, bro, yeah, we didn't know what happened, bro. Because it was almost like a year and a half, almost two years that I was on the shelf, you know. And I was still training. I was still teaching. I was still involved in the martial arts, but I was just training. I was just training in the underground, you know what I mean? Just training, doing my thing, but no fights are popping off, none popping off. So that was the biggest thing that I had to deal with was that was like those type, that type of like, you know, little, little, little type of bump like that. But it was all good, bro. Like I kept faith. I never lost faith in myself. You know what I mean? I always had faith that, that I was going to, I was going to make it happen and keep going. You know what I mean? Eventually I got, got, got another fight, got another win, you know? Then I got that call for the ultimate fighter like this, man. And I was just like, man, it was, uh, it was, uh, it was, it was, it's incredible, bro. If you would have told me, you know, in 2017, when I lost the contenders that, that, oh, I saw, if you would have told me for the future that I'd later become ultimate fighter champion, I would be like, man, that's so far fetched. That's <laughs> insane, bro. But you could have wrote a better story. So I'm just, uh, I'm so thankful, bro, for sure. I love it. Um, there's a member of our team here at MMA Fighting. His name is Jose Youngs. He's a huge anime fan, and he has instructed me to ask you some anime questions. Now, I have to be honest with you, Ricky. I know nothing about anime. Nothing. Nothing at all. I, I think I, I know Pokemon. Is Pokemon considered anime? Yes, yes, yes. This is, this, is, this, is, this is anime. Okay. All right. My kids watch that sometimes, but that's it. So what are your favorites? What what should people uh, be watching right now based on what – or reading – uh, based on what you're uh, reading as well. Ah, great question, great question. Well, I mean, I guess, like I said, number one, number one for me is the Dragon Ball Z series. I'm such a huge fan of Dragon Ball Z. And then if you're talking about the reading, the manga right now, that's at his high time peak right now. Vegeta just got, you know what I mean, his, uh, his ultra destruction mode, you know what I mean? So new transformations, that's always cool, you know what I mean? So number one for me was always DBZ, you know what I'm saying? But I grew up watching many different animes. We all know what's up when Toonami was big, when we were youngins, you know what I mean? For all the otakus, you know what I mean? So like all them, all them great ones that were on Toonami, like Yu Yu Hakusho, Roroni Kenshin, you know what I'm saying? Freaking, um, 
but then as well, like some of the new age stuff, you know, we, we, we know the new age shamans, you know what I'm saying? Like, like the hero academias, you know what I'm saying? Hey, we, we got some attack on Titan fans, I'm sure in the house, you know what I'm saying? That, that jujutsu kaizen, you know what I'm saying? But uh, yeah, so I'm a big I, fan. We're watching a lot of them. I have no idea what you're like, talking about. Like I've never heard of no, any of those all names. Good. That's all. I got, I got, I'll go on all day, but I, you know, I just keep it going. Right, right over my head there. Holy smokes. Do you collect the cards too? Uh, no, I don't. I don't be doing the. I don't have any collectibles like oh, that, no sir. Man. All right. Well, so when you were in the house, could you read comics and stuff like that, or did they only like you're not allowed to even do that as well? Yes. No, we didn't. Uh, we weren't allowed to bring anything. That's we, whack, we weren't allowed man. to bring anything like that. No, no comics and then like that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, yeah. So that's just, whack. We just, do you think it's unfair? Yeah. Like, hey, come on. Can we can we get like a comic? I mean, I understand they don't want you on your phone and stuff like that, but it seems a little bit extreme, no? Yeah, bro. Like, hey, they, they really wanted us to be in there, like, like some cage wolves, bro, in the jungle, man. Yeah. So it was, uh, it was, a, it was a madhouse. Yeah. Okay, so you said you're a little bit uh, banged up. Obviously, you've been very active the last few months. Uh, do you think you'll fight again this year? Or do you think you'll take the rest of the year off? Great question. Well, you know, um, I guess we'll see. We'll, we'll see what happens. I'll leave it up for leave it up for the mystery. I guess right now Whoa. on the Ariel Hawani show. It right? sounds it sounds yeah. like you got something already, Ricky. What's up? No, I don't got anything like that, nah, bro. The fight was on Saturday. I know. <laughs> no, I don't got nothing lined up okay. yet, but right. uh, you know. I, I'm a, I, I, I always feel it when I feel the, when I feel the bloodlust pumping deep in my heart, though, I be like, oh, it's hard to resist, you know? So, but, uh, you know, right now I just focus on the healing process at the moment. For I sure. got you. Do you do spiritual things to heal? Are, are you that kind of guy or do you just let the body heal and that's it? Great question. No, for sure. Uh, like even some of the smallest things, right? If you ask me on a some spiritual note, it's like one thing that does that, that I do enjoy whenever you're doing your meditation practices. But then not just the meditation practices, but then you practicing it as well with the deep breathing, you know, shout out to Wim Hof, you know what I mean? And the Wim Hof method, you know what I mean? So all the different types of meditative states, we're doing the breathing techniques, that's helping with that blood flow and that circulation, right? You practice it too when we're doing cold therapy, hot therapy, you know what I mean? Those are different meditative states you go into too whenever you're uh, in that physical form as well, though. Like you go make, go in and hop in with some hot stuff, you know what I'm saying? Then after you do the hot, go jump into that ice cold ice bath right here in the in the tub. You know what I'm saying? After you do that, go back into the heat, meditate in there. You know what I mean? So those are good little techniques if I could share two right now on the camera like that, that for sure I believe help with the healing process. Uh, two last quick things. What's your connection to uh, Uriah Faber and Team Alpha Male? Because I know you live in Houston, train in Houston. You're an instructor there as well, but you've also been to the gym in Sacramento. So what's are you? Do you mm -hmm. go there too to train? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um. To, yeah. The Team Alpha Male Squad. That, that's that's my home away from home. You know what I mean? Like Sacramento. That literally became my home back in what 2015 is when I moved and packed my bags and, and moved away to California. You know what I'm saying? California dreaming, baby. <laughs> and uh, I was what 22 at the time. That was my first time away from home. You know. So me. So I've been living out there. What for? Like um. I lived out there for for six years living in Cali. You know what I mean? I would literally be living out there. I'd come back home for a fight. You know what I'm saying? I'd come back home for a month for a birthday, maybe. I'd come back home for a month for Christmas. You know what I'm saying? That's about it. So for, from 2015 all the way to 2020, 2021, like that, uh, yeah, man, I was literally living in Cali. You know what I mean? I couldn't have done it without the team Alpha Male Squad. You know what I mean? So they were, they, 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 they are a huge, a huge, um, you know, a piece of my whole development as a mixed martial artist. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so that's a great part of my story. Not, not just also in my story of learning my martial arts techniques, because I was only four fights deep. I was four and oh when I had, uh, went to Sacramento to train with the team Alpha Male Squad. You know what I mean? But, uh, not just in my development as a fighter. But more so too, just my development as a person, you know what I mean? Because while I was living out there, you know, that's my first time being on my own. I was busting the tables. I was, you know, uh, working the, working the, uh, working at the vitamin store, you know what I mean? Before I eventually though, you know, like around my second year started teaching classes there too, you know what I mean? So for the longest time, I was running the kids program over there. Uh, me and me and all the boys over there, you know what I mean? We're running it with, uh, running it, running the kids class and teaching the kids there too. You know what I'm saying? And that was kind of my last, uh, my, those are like the later years over there 
on the squad, you know, and, uh, you know, so shout out to everybody on the team because I couldn't have done it without them. You know what I mean? So that's why I always represent Gracie Ball, the Woodlands, and Team Alpha Male as well. You know what I'm saying? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's incredible. Any, um, any lyrics, anything you want to leave us with before we say goodbye? Any karaoke, Ricky? Oh my God! Uh, I couldn't do the karaoke right now. I, I see you though, baby. I know. I see you. I see you <laughs> okay, next time. Up. Promise, next time you'll hook us up with something. Look. Yes. Look, hey. Next time I'll hook y'all up. That way I'll have something rehearsed. Okay. I'll have done my warm ups and everything, and uh, I'll, I'll be able to do. I'll do something online. You know what I mean? All right. Fair Bro. enough. You've given us enough, so I appreciate it very much. Congratulations, my friend. Uh, keep being you. Don't change. You don't need to hear it from me, but. I love how unique you are, and I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, on this journey in the UFC now. Congratulations. Hey, I really, I really appreciate it, Ariel. Thank you, brother. You have a good day, my friend. You too. Take care, bud. There he is, Ricky Hadouken. Don't call him Pretty Ricky anymore, all right? No more Pretty Ricky. Ricky Hadouken Tertios, who is the, uh, the newest Ultimate Fighter winner. Um, he won on Saturday, and uh, they actually gave out two trophies. He really stood out to me. Uh, very unique character, fun-loving guy. I don't know why I'm so uh, removed from the microphone here. I like to get comfortable, you know? Um, so anyway, great character and uh, someone that I look forward to seeing develop in the UFC. I, I, I wrote last week, didn't watch a lot of the season, I have to be honest, um, just because there's just so much. Like, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't, I hardly ever watch Contender Series. And my reason for that is, A, I just feel like there's a lot. I, I have mixed feelings towards it. Um, they're giving out these contracts like Halloween candy. I can't imagine what it would be like to, for, you know, for a Brendan Lochnane, um, who got raw. And I, we, we continue to talk about that, but it just seemed like there was more to that story. In any event, now losers are getting it. Winners are getting it. That's fine. Just feels like a really easy way to get people into the system, a cheap way, if I'm being honest. And, uh, I don't know. It just like, UFC caliber, what does it all mean uh, these days? So I have weird feelings towards it. It's like, okay, let's get as many 10 and 10 guys in here, eight and eight guys, whatever it is. Um, and the middle class kind of loses its spot. And then you bring in all these guys who are supremely uh, young and raw and green and who don't command a lot of money. And of course, there's going to be some prospects here or there that emerge. Same with Ultimate Fighter, but there's just so many guys in the contract. Like, how much is there out there right now in terms of talent? So, weird feelings. I did check it out yesterday because of uh, Laura Sanko, who became the first. Now, it's not the UFC. They say it's not the UFC, although we all know it's the UFC. First female color analyst for a UFC event or somewhat UFC event. Since UFC won, Kathy Long did it. So there hasn't been another uh, well-deserved, well-earned. She did a great job. In fact, she's doing three jobs. I hope she's getting paid for this. She's doing the color analyst. Uh, she's doing the in-ring announcing. And she's also doing the backstage reporting. Crazy. Uh, no one does that. So congratulations to her. I checked it out for her. Um, and I'm very, very happy that she got that opportunity. And we might be joined by her later in the program. I didn't want to say because she's flying. But we might be, so stay tuned for that. For now, though, we're going to go back to the Zoom machine and say hello to one of my favorite guests in the history of this program. Man, have we had some good memories with this man on this show. And I knew that we had to have him back on one of our first shows, and uh, I found the right time, I think, to do so. So here he is, the one and only, the inimitable, the incomparable, the often imitated, the never duplicated... Rage and Ally Quinta. Al, how are you? Oh, yes. Ariel, we are back. We're the back, MMA baby. Hour. <laughs> this is incredible. You are on fire, my friend. I'm so happy. I'm so happy that you asked me to be on. Now I'm here. Saw you this weekend at the fights. Crazy. Man, man. MMA Hour is back. You're on top of the world. Good for you, man. Thank you. And we had a lot of great memories in this studio. You know, I'll never forget, you know, the Monday after the Habib fight. Uh, the infamous trip to Vegas. I mean, we've had some good times here, you know, some ups and some downs. You've been a big part of this yeah. show, so it wouldn't be the same without you, my man. Uh, it's been it's been fun. I'm, I'm uh, I don't know if anyone was as excited as me to, have, <laughs> to to watch the MMA hour twice a week. Now we we used to be once a week. I no. used to sit here, you know, after training, come back, watch the MMA hour. Even before I was even in the UFC, I I was watching and I was like. You know, one day I'm going to be on that show, and here we are, years He's later. Part it's of like it. it's surreal. I love it. I, oh, by the way, what's that picture behind you? That painting? Who's that? Is that you? 
No, that's Mr. Penn. That's Mr. Penn. Oh, it clearly is not you. I can tell now, but who is that? Mr. Penn. I sold Mr. Penn a house without saying a single word to him. <laughs> he doesn't you... speak English. Okay. His wife barely speaks English. I don't even know. I don't remember how to say his wife's Z-I-L-X-X-I-O-U. Q U E yeah Zioa, I, Shaiwa, I, I used to know I forget it was years ago but I sold I sold him a house and I didn't say I, his wife translated the whole time and she barely knew but he found out about halfway through the process that I was a UFC fighter and <laughs> he <laughs> he got so excited the first time he saw me he must have watched all my videos and he was like shadow boxing he was like oh 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 and he's doing the whole thing and he was yeah every time he saw me after that he got so excited his eyes lit up so a good friend of mine nick tobin not underscore original four on instagram he's an incredible artist he okay. does some really good work and uh he was kind of like he was kind of like in a rut, I guess. Didn't really know what to, he had nothing, no projects that he was working on. And, and I was like, I sent him the picture of Mr. Pan. And this guy was so happy when he bought his house. He was, I don't know much. I don't, I don't really know him. I, like, I feel like I know the guy just without talking to him. But the day he, he bought, he bought a condo in Westbury. It's like five minutes from the hospital. Him and his wife both work at the hospital. And, uh, just the, the the look on his face when he got those keys, he was so happy. I was like, this is the coolest. To me, I, everyone comes in the house, and uh, I show them, you know, I have a, some some artwork and stuff that I bought, like Jaws, uh, Jaws and uh, Point Break artwork, stuff like that. But uh, I show them this, and I, I'm so excited, and everyone's like, okay, that's uh, <laughs> all right, cool. You know what I mean? But to me, this is the freaking, this is the coolest that, thing. That is a great story. It's just like, uh, yeah, yeah. Really cool. Did you did me. you tell him? Did you tell him that you did that? That you made that? No, no. He doesn't this know. Is, I just he just did this maybe uh, I don't know a couple months ago. Okay. I haven't. I haven't. I kind of lost touch with them. I should. I should see how they're doing. I only talk to. I. I mean, it's hard to really, really talk to them. I call. I call her, and it's like uh, you know, it's it's a weird conversation because she understands one one out of every I don't know how many words. But uh, yeah, we would, we would. It was all email, and she would translate. And it was broken English and stuff like that. I don't even remember how I got in touch with them in the first place. This was so. It was like when I first started. You know, I was. Uh, I was. Um, yeah, I was just. Uh, it was probably like. It was probably like a year before the Diego Sanchez fight. Oh wow! Kind of thing. Yeah, how, yeah. By the way, I hear the market is killing it these days. Is that true? On fire, I hear. Yeah, it's wild right now. It's wild. It's I mean, it's 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 good if you're selling a house. Good time to sell. If you're trying to buy a house, a lot of my friends they're trying to buy their first houses and it's it's not it's not fun. It's not easy. They're uh you know, they're like it's it's a fight to get a house, but um but, but I, yeah, you know, I hear that right now. People keep saying good time to sell, but if you sell, you going you're going to have to buy, right? Like you can't just unless you're selling to rent, right? So I mean, I mean pretty much that it's hard if you have to if you have to sell in order to buy you're getting beat out by people that they don't have to sell anything gotcha okay. you know what I mean so if, if you can afford two mortgages and you have the down payment for the second house you're in good you're in a good position because then you can then you can sell your house after after yeah. the fact okay but if it's contingent on on you selling your house you're in big trouble it's it's hard it's a it's uh it's crazy out there. I've never, I mean, I have been doing it a short, a short time, but I've never seen anything like this. And everyone, when I, three years ago, everyone said, Oh, you know, the market's crazy. It's going to, you know, there's going to, the bubble's going to burst and it just keeps getting crazier and crazier. This is, it slowed down a little bit about three, four months ago. I had to take Volante looking for houses. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Could you imagine that? That should have been a reality show. This guy, Volante's, we're all going to go, we're in an open house, we're in an open house to see, and uh, he's he's moving back to Levittown where he grew up, um, and we're on we're online to go see, and with COVID, you have to, they only let one person in at a time oh. to see the house, so there's a line outside of the house at these open house, 
and he's online just making fun of everybody on the line. Oh no! <laughs> he's like, I'm out of here. I go, we got, we got to go. I'm out. I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. I go, Vante, this is a good house. Yeah, I mean, he ended up getting one of them, but uh, yeah, he should be closing like next week. Oh wow! Um, so he's all grown up. He's got a baby now. He's he's got a house. Uh, hey. He's, he's, uh, he's, uh, I've never seen that guy happier. He's, uh, he's really, he's, he's grown up for real. He's, he, he's, he got out of Long Beach, Long Beach, Long Island's, uh, fun party town. So he's selling his house down there, made a killing on it. Um, the house appreciated tremendously since he bought it like two years ago. And now he's, uh, he's going, he's taking his talents back to Levittown. And his uh, his kids will go to MacArthur where he went, and they'll probably terrorize the place just like he's did. <laughs> uh, well, we can talk <laughs> about this uh, all day long, but I know some people want to hear about you, the fighter, as well. Uh, we found out this weekend, um, nice Tecate cup over there, by the way. Um, that's a, it's a good cup. Yeah. I got this from the fight. Oh, oh wow. Oh, I remember when you went. Didn't you like sit all the way at, at the top? Didn't you get like tickets like last? I was in the last. <laughs> I was in the last seat. I, the concrete was behind me. I was. I just happened to be in Vegas. I think someone was trying out one of my teammates for the Ultimate Fighter, and I was there like an extra day. And I was like, I, I just gotta go. I was like, yeah. I, I'm here for this. I gotta just. I bought a ticket, and I on the way out, I there was a bunch of cups. It was like a stack this yeah, hard, yeah. and I took them. Um, so I like love that you still have it. That was like six years ago right? or something, five years ago. Okay, so we found out this weekend, Ally Quinta, Bobby Green, I feel like you guys have been circling each other for years. I feel like you guys have been you know, talking about each other, and now we're getting to actually see you fight. This is exciting, right? Uh, we were supposed to fight years ago, and uh, I don't even know what happened, but then he came up to me. We, I saw him at uh, one of the fights. We were in the back. Um, I think it was with Aljo's fights and, uh, and I saw Bobby Green in the back and we kind of had little words going back and forth. And I was like, oh, oh man, this is going to be awkward. It's always awkward that yeah. it happens, you know? Right, right, right. And we're like, we're like stuck in the same room. And I was like, oh shit, this is going to be awkward. But he came up to me and he was like, yo, I'm really sorry. I, 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 uh, you know, I got hurt, you know, respect, I respect every, you know, like respect. And I was like, oh, all right, cool. I didn't even know what the hell happened. I was like, oh, I guess he got hurt. And that's why the fight never happened. There's, you know, so long ago, I forget these things, but he was, he kind of, he, uh, you know, he was cool, but, um, that's the fight that really is uh, intriguing to me. Uh, his styles, he's got a, he's like got a one of a kind style and, um, he's got a one of a kind style. He's been around forever. I remember, I think he was, he fought in that affliction show. He fought the Lazone. Yes. He fought yes. Dan Lazone. Dan Lazon, yes. And that was so long ago. You know what I mean? So I've been mean, I like fights like that, where it's like a guy that's been around for a while. He's got like his own style. He's, it's going to be a fun fight. It's going to be a fun fight. I was kind of disappointed um, that they announced the fight um, the way that they did. Cause I, I haven't, I mean, they asked my manager, about the fight, and I was like, "Yeah, we'll we'll take the fight." But I've been out for a while, and um, there's a few things with like my contract that are unclear. So um, I've been trying to get a hold of Sean Shelby and Hunter uh, for like the last week and a half, two weeks. Um, and I haven't really heard back from them. I, I've been told now today I'm going to get a call from Sean Shelby. Um, but yeah, it's just stuff that I like. Like want to clear out. My last fight was in Australia, and there was it was um there was a few things there was a few things like that were in the contract that were um that were up in the air, and we just gotta get that s sorted out. I fell I was watching the fights on Saturday, and I fell asleep watching them. I was, I've been training freaking hard, Ariel. Okay. So I I got back I got back after after uh. You know, I was training. I got back just in time for the fights. I put them on. I was supposed to end. I was supposed to go down to a friend of mine's house, and I was watching the prelims. And then I woke up, and it was like the Barbosa fight. And I was like, "What the fuck?" I look at my phone. I had nine thousand messages and Instagram this and Twitter that. I was like, "What the hell is going on? What happened? Like, what the hell?" And then I'm seeing that they announced the fight, and I was like, "What the fuck?" I haven't like. They, I haven't signed the contract. I hate when they do that. They've done this to me once before, and it's it's really not the right thing to do. It kind of bothers me a lot, um, especially the fact that they know I've been trying to get a hold of them, a hold of them, and uh, and just. But I, I'm sure it's going to get taken care of. 
And, uh, you know, it's just something that, like, would, I, it would be really exciting if I was, if it was all, like, set, you know what I mean? Like, if, um, you know, if it was all really, like, set to go and, and the contract was signed and everything, and then and then I announced it. So I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's going to happen. I think that they, I'll get the, you know, I'll, I'll talk to them today. But it's just, I don't know, it, it, it could have been done better, I think, well, the way they announced it. Look, I'm not trying to start anything here, but. I just went through a situation where I'm signing contracts and stuff like that, employment. I wouldn't want anyone to announce that I'm joining their team before things are being addressed in the contract. I mean, that's just not how business is done, right? I mean, like, yeah. especially when you're trying to reach out and get a hold of someone to talk about what's in the contract and then they just go and announce it. Let me ask you this. What if you would have announced it before they were ready to announce it? Lord have mercy on all our souls. From the from the depths of hell, they would come and swallow us up if you announced the fight before they told you to announce it. Because I've 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 been on the receiving end of that. Wow, we're not ready. Blah, 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 blah. So yeah, I agree with you. That's bush league. Yeah. I mean, they they should at the very least they should get back to you and hear you out about what you want to talk about and then announce it. Why? Let me ask you a question. Why'd they have to announce it on Saturday, August 29th? Like, what, what was the rush? The tickets aren't going yeah, on. Well, yeah. No, it was a big, you know, the big card, I guess they wanted to just. Yeah, I know, but the uh, card is in two and a half months or two months or something like that. Yeah. Can I give you my theory why they announced these fights like this? Go for it. Yeah, yeah. Is this going to get, like, I don't want to ruffle feathers, you know? Well, I know, I know, the, I know that, I know the reason. What do you think? But let's hear your theory. Well, the, the reason is they know that you want to bring something up and they announce it. And then, uh, you know, what if things fall through? Oh, we announce it. And then it looks bad on you if you withdraw. So let's get it out yeah. there. You kind of said yes, but I want to talk about some things. And what if they don't want to address the things that you want to talk about? I don't know what these things are. They're personal. But then, oh, but it's already out there. I mean, let's be honest. They do this to a lot of people. You're not the only one. I'm sorry to say. Like, they get the news out there before things are being signed so that they could say, ah, it's out. Everyone go gaga. Right to Al. It's going to be the best night in the history of fighting. And then you're like, but wait, I, I just want to talk about it. No, but it's out already. Everyone's so excited. It's going to uh, be great. Uh, yeah. I, well, I got a million calls and texts from people. Oh, we're coming. We're coming. I'm like, dude, what the fuck? <laughs> you know, it puts me in a weird spot. Cause I'm like, uh, the, uh, like I said, I'm sure it's going to get taken care of. And I hope it does. Big issues or small issues? Uh, uh, no, I mean, it's it depends on who's looking at them. I right. think in the grand scheme of things, it's a little, it's not a big issue. Um, but uh, but yeah, you never know. You never know. And it's just weird that I haven't, that it's been this long. My manager is hounding them. I've been hounding them and I haven't gotten a call back. And um, yeah, it's just, it's, for 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 a guy like me that's been I feel like I've look I freaking the over the last two years I have spent an inc I've spent so much time energy and money to get to this point where I'm able to fight again and I'm like looking forward and feeling good to fight and it was like I had surgery I didn't really tell anybody I had two surgeries in in like a week a year ago it was about a year ago. Whoa. And on what? Yeah, and it, I had, uh, I got my nose. I had a deviated septum in my, so my knee, the, my knee, I have always been having problems with. Um, and the doctor said, uh, you know, he, there's some scar tissue in there. We should go in and, and take that scar tissue out. So I sort of got a second opinion. He said to do some injections, physical therapy. I did the physical therapy and injections. And this all took a while, you know, it was like six months of physical therapy injections. And it was still giving me pain. I ended up getting the surgery. Uh, surgery uh, took a really long time. It's just, I've, I've been through a lot with the, with the knees. And um, it just took forever for me to start feeling good again. It was, it was, and then the knee starts hurting and then the knee felt good, but it, because so long I was compensating for the knee, then the hip, the back, everything starts to get out of whack. It's like, you got to just figure it out to where everything kind of comes together and you know, your body's working. It's one little thing just can throw you off so much. And I, f I found that out over the last couple of years. But uh, it was it was like excruciating. I was not in a good med. I was not doing good. I was like, uh, it was it was it was not fun. Um, and I was I was driving to uh, HSS in the city twice a week 
I mean, you leave, you leave at 10 o'clock. I think I left at like 10 o'clock in the morning. I'd get back at like four or five o'clock uh, with traffic. You know, you do an hour and a half of physical therapy. It's a full day thing. You're not getting paid. I'm, I'm, I have to pay for parking. I have to pay for gas. Like this is a, this is expensive. I can, I, you know what I mean? This is a, uh, there's a lot of, that's a lot of time that I should be making money or doing something that I'm just really spending money to, to try to get back. So I, I've spent so much time and energy. I went out to Vegas. I was out in Vegas for a month. Um, and, and I worked with the the team there at the PI and, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been a long road. It's been long. It's been hard. And, um, you know, my last fight in, in Australia didn't really go my way, but it was, I mean, that's freaking, it's expensive. And to go, to go to Australia, I've had to fly a bunch of people out and everything. Um, they did, they paid for my, my hotel and Airbnb. I rented a big Airbnb and stuff. So that it's stuff like that, that were, that, that they did for me back then. Now this is at MSG. It's a little different. So, um, they would just have to clear up a few things on what I'm going to be getting for this fight. And, and I, so I'm sure it's stuff that, uh, you know, it's for a guy that's been around as long as I have and and done what I've done and, and we've been through what I've been through to get back to where I'm at right now. It just it it I, I would have rather have been announced a little differently. It kind of to be honest, it kind of like hurt me a little bit. I was kind of it was it was kind of like, uh, I don't know, it just it didn't. Uh, it, it a bad taste in my mouth. I wanted to be like, but you know what? It freaking kind of like motivated me too. I'm I, I like fuck everybody. You know what I mean? You, you, what the fuck is that shit? But I love it. I love it. I see the raging. I, I see the raging outcome. I, 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 I promised my mom I wouldn't get crazy. <laughs> okay, fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, c- can I ask at any point in that process? Because you just laid it out how it was difficult mentally and physically. Did you ever think like, man? enough of this crap like it's been so many surgeries and and therapy and, and and physio and all this stuff like i'm done with this did you ever feel like you were close to just saying i'm done yeah a lot a lot there was a there was a lot of it was probably like 75 percent of the time wow 80 90 percent of the time over the last two years i was like i don't think i don't know if i'm gonna fight i don't know if i'm gonna be able to and and i don't know if i even want to but um I mean, I've done, I think once you fight, you can, I can do free, like, I can do anything. I think I really do believe that if I put my energy of the energy that I put into fighting, if I put that into anything in the world, like I do, I'm do, I started this real estate thing. I just got my real estate license, did the agent thing. I did, I did pretty freaking good, like right off the gate, just because I put all my energy and I was still kind of like not able to put all my energy because I was fighting. And then I got more into investments and, and investing in properties. And, and I put a lot of energy, but I wasn't able to put all my energy into it because in the back of my head, I was always, there's always like, I'm that, I feel like I, I made myself into a fighter and once you, and that's like, there's nothing that compares to that. That's what I really feel like that was, that's what I'm meant to do. Like I'm, I'm meant to, to, just that's there's no one as tough as me there's no one that can there's no one that can um like solve a problem within 15 minutes as as good as i can there's there's guys that are better than me like there's no reason kevin lee should there's like guys like kevin lee like i beat kevin lee that was a problem that i solved pretty 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 well over the course of 25 minutes the guy was a, a sick wrestler. If you look at that guy, he's a freaking, the guy's a tank. You know what I mean? But there's, there's that, there's a weakness there. And, and in, in all the other, all the other fights that, especially the last two, the ones that I lost, there were definitely avenues where I could have won that fight that I messed up. And I, I, I know that I can, I can make those corrections. And it's like, I have kind of, I have some unfinished business and, and this is what I was meant to do. So I, I, I gotta, I'm, I'm not like a young kid anymore. I'm getting to the point where I'm a, a mature, uh, a mature fighter. I'm a mature person. I feel like over the last two years, even though I haven't been fighting, I feel like I've gained so much. I've gained so much knowledge just of the world and myself and 
uh, being around all my teammates. Um, I think it's all coming together. Like it's all coming together right at the right time. So this is, this is the, the perfect fight for me to come back. It's at MSG. It's, it's first time, right? Card. My first time at Brooklyn, MSG. But yeah. Yeah. You had the Brooklyn one, of course, but this is, I mean, it's a, it's a dream come true for any New Yorker, right? Yeah, this is, I mean, this is, it's unreal. It's unreal. The card is unreal. The, the people on this card, the fight, it's just, MSG, my everyone is so excited. It's uh, yeah, this is gonna be this is gonna be fun, and I've I've I I've earned every bit of this. I've put so much work in. Like I've come, I've I'm uh, yeah, I'm just looking forward to really, really uh, getting. I'm, I'm focused, but there's nothing. There's no focus like a fight camp focus. Mm -hmm. I get more done in life when I'm training for a fight, like if someone wants, if someone's looking for a house, I'm my, my days are down to the minute, every minute, my, my off time, I'm looking at houses for people. Like if you look at, if you look at my, how many houses I've sold <laughs> when I'm fighting, I sell the most houses because my, my time is so well managed. Cause I know every second has to be, accounted for when I don't have a fight coming up, I, I kind of get a little lackadaisical and it's, um, it's a, it's a, I'm always thinking about, you know, if I'm not working out, I'm thinking about working out and I get, I wake up, I get my workout in, I have the downtime. I do everything that I need to do. I get my workout in, I sleep better. I, I, I'm exhausted when I go home. I, I get to sleep. I sleep well, I wake up and it's just every single day you have, you're focused on, outworking the guy that you're going to fight. There's no one outworking me. It's not happening. So I'm really looking forward to the next, what is it? Eight, nine weeks of, of that focus and that uh, just, I really feel like I'm, I'm going to get so far ahead of everybody in the next, in the next couple of months. I love it. And uh, I love that you're back and I love that you're healthy and that you're getting a chance to fight in New York. You deserve that, getting a chance to fight at the Mecca. i love to see you in uh, Georgia as well. I saw you and uh, Aljo and Marav. It looked like they treat you like kings over there. Did they roll out the red carpet for you guys? But they, Marab is, he's <laughs> Elvis Presley, Justin Bieber. Really? All in, yeah. I mean, he got, we got off that plane, and from the time we got off that plane, Anybody that saw him came up running up to him and they were like, Marab, Marab, take pictures. We took not, we took so many pictures with people. I mean, really, we just, I mean, they, they, they know me and Aljo because of Marab. I mean, the UFC, but right. really, Marab was, he's, he's, um, and that's how it should be. A guy like him, that's, that's the kind of guy that, uh, that should be a superstar. You know what I mean? Here, no one really, you know, no, people don't really know him. They might know, uh, you know, Sugar Sean O'Malley or somebody like that walking down the street. The guy's got the colorful hair. He's, he's you know, he's telling everybody how much weed he smokes and this, like, oh, we get it. We smoke weed. Freaking <laughs> Marab comes from the Republic of Georgia. Yeah. Came here with, like, nothing. He was renting a room in some in random people's houses. He didn't. He was at a different gym. He was kind of bouncing around. Ends up finding our gym, and he couldn't very, he couldn't speak English very well. The the as you, you can tell a person by the way they train, you know what I mean. Like Ray says, Lando says this all the time. Like you, there's no hiding who you are in the in the train in, in sparring or in a fight. Like who you are, you can tell about a person. So right off the bat, we could tell kind of who he was. He's he is a hardworking guy that he just keeps going and going. He's the machine. And, but outside the cage, he's the nicest guy. When you're, when you're with him and you know, you're going to a fight, he'll carry your bags. And then if we're going to his fight, I'm trying to grab his bag and he's not letting me. Can I go, Rob, it's your, it's, you know what I mean? That's yeah. just the kind of person he is. He wants everyone around him to feel comfortable and everything. And over the, over the years, that was maybe 10 years ago, now he's he's his English is really good. He can he can speak English very well, and uh, just what a what a what a cool part. What a great like I can't even I don't even know what to say. Like everyone needs 
you're if you if you're lucky enough to find a person and become friends with them the way we uh you know became friends with Marab then then I mean you 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 can't do any better than that the guy is just no one has a bad thing to say we go to we go to Georgia and it kind of the, the people in Georgia are like that they welcome us it was like they rolled out the red everything training we trained hard um we Marab loved teaching he liked you know teaching uh to to the he I think he motivated that whole country just by being there the entire country wow he motivated the entire country by t- he he taught seminar we taught seminars every day training with the people he took it by the end of it me and Aljo were like Jesus Christ man like another picture and they always go they go so the, they they can they know how to say one more picture you know what I mean yeah, yeah, yeah. so they come up to you and they go one more picture yeah. And I go, okay, one more. And then the next person goes, one more, one more picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the next person goes, and it's like, you because it messes with your head. You're like, all right, one more and we're done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not that it's a bit, but after, I, I mean, know. we did so much. We were on like no sleep. We were freaking waking up early, traveling, teaching. I, we got so much done in those, uh, in those, um, I don't know, six days. We got, we, we did like six seminars. We saw so much. We we saw the, the whole country, and and really, I think he he went back there to, uh, you know, not like be like, oh, I'm a Rob, I'm the superstar. He went back there to like motivate the younger the younger guys coming up, and it's it's kind of the uh, MMA scene there is is it's starting to grow now with guys like him and, and Giga now. Uh, it's I think I think it's going to be a hotbed for real. They have they have. Um, they they definitely have um, like all the re- it's it's kind of the place where you would you would find you would think that a lot of good fighters coming from they just don't maybe have the uh, the gyms and the equipment and stuff like that but now that now that um, now that they're really starting to focus on MMA and they got a few standout guys and uh, I think it's really going to be I think it's really going to be good it's, yeah Al you're the man uh, thank you for coming on. This was good stuff. I feel the fire back. I feel the healthiness oozing out of you. Let me know if you need me to put in a call to Sean or Mick, Hunter, these guys. You know, we're, we're on a first-ring basis. So if you need me to uh, move some mountains for you, I'm always happy to do so. Yeah. Thank you for always coming on and, and being so gracious with your time. And I can't wait to see you fight at the Mecca, the world's most famous arena. It's about time you get to fight there. And it's, uh, it's a very exciting thing. So I'm very happy for you. Welcome back. Ariel. Thank you, brother. Don't do it. Don't it's do it. Fun. Don't. <laughs> it's been fun. I just spent a lot of money. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> this guy is crazy. He is. <laughs> uh, if you're a longtime fan of the show, you know that he always loves to uh, slam his laptop when he's on. Um, and I hope he didn't break it. I pray that he didn't break it. What a character, Ali Quinta. They do that a lot with the contracts. It's not right. And I'm happy he said something. I'm not trying to, again, want to preface, not trying to get him intro, not trying just to, but like, in what universe is it okay to announce something, anything? I'm not talking about fighting. Uh, you can talk about basketball, baseball, media. Uh, you work at a beauty salon. Um, in, in what universe is it okay to announce something before it is agreed upon, before it is signed. That's not okay. And I bet you if the the roles were reversed, it would definitely not be okay. What if Ally Quinta wanted to fight against Bobby Green and they weren't down with that? And he's like, oh, I'm fighting. Like, what? That That's not how it works. They do this a lot when there's an issue coming up that needs to be addressed. And so they put it out there to put pressure. And if I'm being honest... They do it with media. They'll give them stuff. Media doesn't check on it. And then it gets out there and it's reported and people take it as gospel. And then it's out there. And then the fighter is left, you know, thinking like, oh, I I can't back out now. My back's against the wall. So it's a tough spot. Uh, Hopefully they get it figured out and we get to see that fight. It'll be a fun fight. Two great characters, two great fighters fighting at the Mecca, Madison Square Garden, world's most famous arena. November 6th here in New York City. All right, uh, let's get to our next guest here. Um, he is one of the very best coaches in MMA, will be on the shortlist 
for 2021 Coach of the Year, was on the shortlist for 2020 Coach of the Year. What he has done, along with his other coaches at Extreme Couture over the past few years, nothing short of amazing. We know that that used to be one of the crown jewel gyms in the sport. They hit a bit of a rough patch. Now they are back to being one of those spots where the best fighters on the planet are going um, to train and to hone their skills, the likes of Francis Ngannou there, the likes of Misha Tate there, and so many others. Unfortunately, and it, it, it pains me that the first time he is on this show or any of my shows is under these circumstances, but unfortunately we found out uh, earlier this week that one of their own, one of their fighters who has worked as a coach and cornerman as well, Kyle Reyes, um, passed away suddenly after some complications following uh, a surgery that he had. And so I wanted to have Eric Nixick on to talk about uh, Kyle and to shed some light on his story. And so again, I, I hate to do it under these circumstances, but I really do appreciate him coming on the program to speak about Kyle. And there he is, Eric Nixick, kind enough to join us. Eric, thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Uh, I mean everything that I said about you. I have tremendous respect for what you have done. I feel bad that the first time you're coming on my shows under these circumstances, and I do want to say that I'm so sorry to you, the team, Kyle's family. I've seen an outpouring of you know emotion and posts and all that about his passing, and so I'm so sorry that this has happened. Uh, thank you for having me, man. And uh, yeah, it's it's been a been a rough couple of weeks for all of us, but uh, you know we're hanging in there. I think everybody obviously deals with death a little differently, but. Um, you know, we're uh, definitely rallying, rallying together as a team and uh, making sure we're there for one another. Uh, before we get to what happened, for those that don't know, because Kyle was an MMA fighter, I think uh, 22 fights um, as far as MMA is concerned on his resume, 30 years old, but also worked as a coach, cornerman as well. Tell us about Kyle. Who was he and, and what did he mean to the gym? Just a, the consummate teammate, the pure definition of a guy that you can count on. Um, anything you needed, any look you needed, uh, didn't matter if it was southpaw orthodox, you know, anywhere from the 35er up to a 55er. He was always in the room and always available to help no matter what. Um, almost one of those selfless guys where he just put his career aside and, and, uh, made sure that he was available to, to anything. Uh, but really what stands out to me was just him, him being the dad that he was, you know, uh, him, him and Kylie had a very close relationship. So uh, Kylie really became part of the team for us. Uh, she's always in the gym, always in the room. And, uh, you know, that, I think that's the biggest thing for us is to make sure we rally around Kylie the best because obviously she lost her father, but we don't want her to feel like she lost the team as well. How old is she? She's seven. Seven. Um, and so what happened to him? Why did he pass away? So the, from my understanding, and, and obviously him and Coach Eddie are very close. Uh, he was roommates with Coach Eddie for a long, long time. From from my, what I understand is, uh, you know, we, we know he went in for bicep tendon surgery. He was going to have surgery on his hand. Um, and under anesthesia, he aspirated. So he got vomit into his lungs. Um, he was released from the hospital after the surgery. But I don't know if anybody knew about the that, about him aspirating. But Coach Eddie found him in his room, unconscious, unresponsive. I believe it was that Saturday oh. and uh, rushed him to the hospital. He had been induced to coma since uh, last Saturday. And then we were waiting kind of hope to see if his, his organs were coming back okay, but it was his brain function that they were waiting on. So that's why they put him in the deuce coma, and then they did an MRI in the brain, and there was no firing. Uh, that was on Sunday. So the, the parents decided uh, to pull the plug on Sunday. Oh, man. That, and so just yeah. he was totally fine before the surgery as far as all of you knew, right? Man, he was he was totally fine. He's been in the gym even – even injured, he's in here and he's helping, he's doing something, you know, to the point where we're like he was he was punching with his good arm, you know, and doing stuff with his good arm, you know, and that's just that's just always been Kyle. It's the guy we know and remember. Uh just a super, super uplifting spirit. He's a great guy on the road to have, you know, he's a guy you can always count on. So that's I mean, everything seemed normal to all of us. And um, you know, Trevin Jones and him are very, very close, both being from Guam. You know, he's been a big part of Trevin's camps and, and he was making himself available even after the surgery to help Trevin, you know, and he's like, no, you need to rest, you know, and that's uh, that same day when uh, when he, um, you know, he's found passed out. Yes, I've seen a, a ton of fight. Um, Trevin, uh, Jeremy Kennedy, uh, Bean Wen uh, writing about him. He fought Alexander Volkanovsky. I, I saw Alex um, write about him as well. Uh, you know, it's like a very, you know, MMA community is getting bigger, but 
you know, I've never, I never met Kyle, but it, it kind of feels like one of our own, right? It, we're just, uh, yeah. you know, uh, this community fraternity, whatever you want to call it. And so how, like, how, how's the vibe at the gym right now? How you, you said everyone's dealing with death differently and, and that's always the case, but you know, a few days removed, how are things at the gym? Uh, I think for us, just trying to become a little bit more organized in the fact of what we want to do for him um, in his memory, starting a fundraiser. Uh, there's no fights next week here in town. So I think that that weekend is a good day to maybe do a seminar. Uh, I'll try to get with Coach Drysdale and figure out if there's a way we can get all the, the community together. And that's what we've done for some of the uh, fallen police officers or people that died within the community. We'll do a seminar and raise the money and, and just give it over to the family. So that might be something that uh, might work out for us in, in regards because the BJJ community, the MMA community here in Vegas is so big. I think we should get, we should get some big names in and help out. Um, we're getting new mats in the gym. So I took some of the old mats with our logo. I'm going to have those autographed by the champs that we've had here. Randy, Forrest Griffin, Francis, Misha, uh, Aljo signed it as well. And I'm going to auction that off for, for Kyle's family and just do the best we can to, to kind of gather the troops and, and, and raise the money for the family. And I do want to, uh, point people towards the GoFundMe page that is up in his honor. Uh, there it is right over there. Um, Currently, as of right now, as, as I'm looking at it, over $21,000 raised uh, in his honor, which is incredible. The goal was 20000 so uh, you've already surpassed that. And I believe if you just search for uh, support the fight for Boom, it will come up. Or if you type in his name and uh, Kyle raise his name and GoFundMe, it will come up. Very easy to find. Um, and so that is pretty amazing. I mean, I, I think this is just a few days old, right? And over 21,000 people. Has that blown you away? Yeah, uh, it does. I think when you look at the number, but then it, it doesn't really surprise you because we just know how tight the MMA community is and how big of a heart that they have in understanding the situation that this um, that Kyle was in. So uh, I hope I hope to double that number by the end of next week and, and get enough money that we can. Francis. Francis is big on, on, you know, helping out Kylie because obviously she's been a mainstay in the gym as well. So, uh, Francis and I talked about yesterday about trying to figure out how to get her scholarship fund set up or trust set up and, uh, make sure she's taken care of when she turns 18. Wow. Uh, that is amazing. So again, um, if anyone wants to check out the, uh, the GoFundMe page, uh, to support Kyle and his family, uh, that would be great. We just put it up there and I will, uh, I will tweet it out as well. Uh, after the show to let people know about it. Um, and for you, you know, it has been, and it, it's hard to transition here, but I, I do want to ask you about yourself. Um, what a, what a run it has been for you, my friend. And, uh, what an amazing thing you've done with that gym. I remember when it first opened and obviously it was Randy involved. Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You were just a student. You just a guy who just kind of climbed the ranks and now you, you've become the head trainer, the, the GM of the gym. You just from being a student many moons ago. I was I was member number one in our Come database. On. I, really? Yeah, no, yeah. I, I I came in the gym where it wasn't even open yet, and Randy was training for Tim Sylvia. And uh, good old Mike Pyle was like, yeah, come on in, kid, and beat the crap out of me for week after week. And I just was dumb enough to keep coming back. <laughs> so, How old were you at that really, time? Um, I was, I was, I mean, I was probably like in my mid twenties, um, but pretty much fresh out of college. And I was, uh, testing for the fire department and for all the agencies here in Vegas. And that's what I was going to school for. And, uh, you know, so I had, I had that as a, what, what I wanted to do for my career, but man, I just fell in love with the sport. I fell in love with the camaraderie and the team that we had around us. And, you know, you can never get me out of this gym. So I've been here for 15 years now, almost. And and so when you are invited by Mike Pyle, did you have a background in fighting at all? Like, did you grow up doing martial arts? I was a college football player. So when I came to the gym, I actually came in with a friend and uh, we thought the gym was open. So we came in to sign up and it wasn't open quite yet. And, but Mike was like, there was like Mike and Jay and, you know, all the boys are in here. And, uh, you know, I was probably 230 pounds at the time. And, and Mike was like, yeah, man, come in, just, you know, start training at the, and, was a little, little did I know that I was the one getting greenlit back then. So, you know, it, it took a while for me to understand. But, uh, you know, I think the, the thing about Mike and those guys was, you know, just keep coming back and they, and yes, you're going to take your lumps and everything else. But, um, you know, I just love the, the competition. I love the camaraderie that, that this gym set. So, uh, they, they can never really get me out of here. And have you stayed the whole time through all the ups and downs? Everything, man. I've seen it all. Wow. That is wild. At what point do you start to say to yourself, I think this might be my career. Like I really enjoy being a part of this. 
Um, you know, Randy and I had those sit downs. We, we talked about, you know, possibly what the future could hold for me here. And, and I, I had like one, one coaching class a week and, but I always made it like important to make it my own and, and, you know, to, to promote it and do the best that I could. And then I took over the kids program and then it was right after that, um, you know, our, our current GM was moving out of town to go become a police officer. And, you know, Randy and I sat down and um, we went and had a beer actually. And I was like, man, what do you want to do? Like, what do you want to do with this gym? Like, what are your goals? And he's like, man, I, you know, I, I want to get back to where we once were, you know, and, and he wants to, he wanted to leave this gym to his son. So, you know, my mind is like, well, do you want to leave him a liability? Or do you want to leave him an asset? Well, we got to start building this thing back up the way we, we can. So um, that's where we got, you know, Dennis Davis has always been here. Uh, Robert Fallis stepped in, you know, myself, we had Ray Cepho. So we had a good group of guys and a good core. And it really start, started to change the standard of the gym and the team. So I think when, when Coach Falls passed away, it was important for us to maintain that same standard that we all set. And, and really keep that in, in his memory because he worked very hard to make this gym what it is too. So, um, but th to remember him the, the right way, we wanted to make sure that we kept that, uh, that standard alive. And obviously it's completely different, but I couldn't help but think of, of Robert when the news of Kyle came out, like your gym has been rocked. This doesn't happen often. Does it feel strange, like a, a bit of deja vu, the worst kind of deja vu, I would imagine, to be going through another tragedy like this? Um, you know, I, I don't know if it, if it prepares you for it the right way, because, you know, coach Fallis's was very sudden and abrupt. Um, whereas Kyle's, uh, you know, we didn't, we didn't know he was going to pass away. We thought he was going to be able to come out of this thing, but it, it did prepare you a little bit for the situation. Um, yeah, I, you know, it's just, it's just hard every time it happens because I think for me, uh, being like the GM and the leader of the gym, you, you're, you're always trying to comfort everybody around you. And for me, it's going to probably hit me in a month from now. Obviously, I was very upset the last couple of days, but, you know, you're just trying to get your ducks in a row for the rest of the guys and the girls in the, in the room. And then for me, probably it'll hit me in about a month from now. Um, and so, you know, obviously you, as you mentioned, the gym is doing okay now. It's doing better than okay. It's, uh, it's one of the top gyms in the sport with some of the best fighters involved. Did you think there was a point where you couldn't get back to where it once was back in the day? Did you feel like, because you know, let's be honest, there was a point where it wasn't as relevant as it was and as it is today. Did you feel like there was a point where, you know, the damage had been done, whatever that damage is? No, not, not really for me. I, I just feel like if you just keep your head down and grind and do the right things, um, let the fighters do the talking for, for you and, um, you know, I, I thought the sky was the limit for us and maybe I'm naive to the fact or I'm blind to it, but I, I just, I believe in what we have here and I believe in the coaching staff and the, in the system that we have that good things are going to happen if we just worked hard and, and, and it has. So, you know, I'm, I'm very proud of what we built, but you know, it's because of that, that system and that, and that team and that coaching staff that we surround ourselves with and the reason why we're in the position we are today. How involved is Randy in the gym these days? <laughs> not much at all. Okay. Not much at all. Yeah. He's, you know, when he retired, he, he made it a point to me to say like, listen, I know it's going to be a transition period. I know it's going to be hard. A lot of the people that were coming to extreme couture were coming just because of Randy. And when Randy left or retired, he really just was had this, like this hard exit and he didn't want people to rely on Randy and, and him being in the gym. He wanted the rest of the people to rely on, on us as a, as a staff. And, you know, that was, it took some time. It took some time to build that, that trust. And once we did, then I feel like, you know, he, he I wouldn't say Randy's obsolete by any means, but he didn't have to be here. He didn't have to be that focal point in the gym. So it's nice now. It's like a, it's like a show and tell day when Randy comes in, it's like, Hey, uh, do you mind if I show something? I'm like, yeah, please. Yeah. You know, like hop on the mat and do some stuff. So, um, you know, I was able to bring him in and, and during the pandemic and help us out a lot with Francis. And, you know, I think he got his uh, competitive juices flowing again. Um, I'm glad to see him commentating for the PFL. So he's damn busy. Okay. Um, your first UFC fight that you cornered, which was it? Martin Campman versus uh, Carlos Condit, number two in Indianapolis. Wow. Okay. Uh, top of yeah. my head, that's August of 2013. Am I right? You might be right. Yo, sounds, I'm so sounds, crazy. Sounds, sounds I'm right. so crazy, Eric. I'm going to say that's August 27th of 2013. Let's look it up right now. I'm Let's I am crazy when it, it comes <laughs> to the, August 27, 2013. I remember. Uh, I remember that fight. Of course, it was right at the beginning of the FS1 era. Uh, there was another yeah. event, um, and I believe, if memory serves me correct, I'm not looking at it yet, I think it was like a few days removed 
Now, before the Benson Henderson Anthony Pettis fight in Milwaukee, the title fight, UFC 164. Okay, let's look it up here together, Eric. I'm getting nervous. Carlos Condit. Uh, the first one was April of 2009. That wasn't the one you're talking about. Yep. And you said Car- that was uh, August 28th, Eric. August 28th. That was off by a day. 2013. I was right. That's Bro, I'll, I'll give you that one. <laughs> Just to have the month right and the year right. I can't remember yesterday. So oh, that my was gosh. Impressive. That is crazy. So that was your first one. Wow. What was that like for you? Yeah. Uh, it was it was pretty surreal because Martin and I have always been very, very close. Um, you know, I've learned a lot from Martin. So for him to have me in the corner, I think it was a big learning experience for me and, and understanding you know what high level um, UFC, MMA and all that stuff felt like and what it looked like. So, you know, he really did me a big favor by by doing that. And, uh, you know, it really helped me kind of kick in the door. Then it was, you know, Brad Tavares. And I've been with Brad ever since then. I think I've cornered Brad for 13 13, 14 fights now. So, um, you know, it was just kind of the domino effect by him having me. And then, you know, I cornered Ray Seffo. It was the first time I was a head coach in a corner. Uh, and all these guys gave me this this great opportunity to kind of be here where I'm at today, help pave the way. Now, Eric, I have to ask you about the man over your right shoulder over there. What is going on here? I mean, the disrespect shown to this man who won the title in March, who should be one of the biggest names in this sport, the John Jones saga, the interim belt. I mean, what's happening here with Francis? How, well, why is this happening? It's all, it's in some ways reminiscent of Randy. Like, why is it whenever, whenever someone becomes a huge star that it's these issues that almost stunt their growth? Can you give us the latest without, you know, you don't, I don't want to get you in trouble or anything, but like, what the heck is going on here? Yeah. You know, I think it's just a, it's a crazy situation for, for everybody. Um, for me, I, I try to look at both perspectives and understand where the UFC is coming from. Uh, I know that they had booked the, the Houston venue and who better to have on that venue than Derek Lewis. Uh, we weren't going to be ready for August. Francis went back home. He had some family things to tend to. He wasn't going to be able to make it back into the States even to even have a training camp. So August was pushing it. So we did agree to September 25th. That's when we were going to fight Derek, but uh, the UFC decided to go with Derek in Houston. So that part made sense to me. Obviously, the interim, that doesn't really make much sense. But again, you know, they're a business. They have to do what's best for them. The thing that I'm happy about the most, though, Ariel, is the fact that Francis has just been in the gym training ever since. The moment we knew we were fighting Derek Lewis, he started camp. So it almost kind of reminds me of the pandemic days, you know, we, when we had uh, Jarzino, we ended up having almost a 14, 15 week camp. And that helped us a lot. It kept his weight down. It kept him active. We got a skill build and do a lot of things behind the scenes. So he's hungry. He's motivated. Uh, I wouldn't say, you know, I don't want to put words in his mouth and say he's disrespected, but the narrative I think is inherent that that's how he's going to feel. But for us, man, um, all the politics and all that stuff, you really can't control. So I just feel like just getting your ass in the gym and working hard and good things will happen. I'm hearing maybe January. Is that, is that what we're hearing? Uh, I'm hoping, and that's that's what we've we've been kicking around. We've been here in January, but you never know, man. Like yeah. the UFC is always willing to throw you a curveball, and like, hey, right, guess what? You're fighting John Jones now. Yeah. You know, so well, I, I'm happy you say that because I feel like the time is now, and I'm not trying to disrespect Cyril, but like that's such a big fight. You know, like we got to try to make that fight, right? The guy's ready to go to heavyweight. Do you think there's any chance, or are you guys preparing for Cyril? Uh, you know, I always think there's a chance and you're absolutely right. I think that is the fight to make. And I, I would hate to miss out on that opportunity right. between Francis and John. It kind of reminds me of when like Pacquiao and Floyd were supposed to fight the first time. Mm-hmm. And then Pacquiao went and got, got starched, you know, or something happened. Yeah. Right. So, um, and then the luster wore away. So I, I'm hoping that that's the fight that happens because honestly, in my mind, I feel that John Jones is the pound for pound go. And as a, as a coach and as a competitor, I want to compete against the best, you know, and I have the utmost respect for John and Brandon Gibson and that team over at Jackson Week. But this is what we want to do. We want to compete. We want to compete against the best available. And I think uh, Cyril is, is put his name in that hat, but that's the fight I think the fans and the, and, the, and the media and everybody wants to make is John and Francis. Were you impressed with what he did against Derek? Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, I was actually more impressed to what he did with Volkov. I thought that fight was going to be more telling, in my opinion, just because of the range and the length and what Volkov's uh, capable of doing as a striker. Now, I think the matchup was going to be tough for Derek. I thought the being in the hometown, there might have been some hometown vibes, something that that where, you know, Derek feels like he's always in the fight no matter what. But for me personally, I, I thought that the the fight versus Volkov was, was uh, the his coming out party, in my opinion. I could sit here and ask you about all your fighters, um, but we don't have all that time. So I'll, I'll just ask you quickly about two. 
Did Misha Tate exceed your expectations? I mean, she looked like, I mean, physically, like her shape that she was in and also the way she fought after the layoff and everything she's been through. That was pretty inspiring stuff. Initially, when she was, you know, planning on coming back, did you think that she could look that good? She's so smart the way she, she trains and the way she takes care of her body. So, you know, we're a bunch of Neanderthals when it comes to men. And she had to actually sit me down and be like, look, this is what my body went through when I had two kids. <laughs> my body's not the same. Huh. So, you know, I have to, I have to make sure that I feel physically prepared to go take this fight. And so she did it smart. You know, she was in the room in the gym for maybe a month and month and a half um, to try to see if this is something that she physically was able to do. And once she was, uh, man, she hit the ground running. You know, she she did all the work she with Coach Cal. Her her diet was on point. Her cardio was on point. And you know, usually she had a, she has to cut about ten pounds to make one thirty five. She didn't cut any weight at all. So that's just a testament to really her and her hard work. Uh, Coach Jimmy Gifford did a, a marvelous job with her striking. You know, he worked a lot behind the scenes, and then myself and Rick Little and Johnny, we were, we were kind of doing the X's and O's. So I thought she did a, a great job. And really, like, yes, it was surprising in a lot of ways, but it's Misha, so a lot of things don't really surprise you when it comes to her. She, she has a really great work work ethic. So, um, you know, now it's, it's, it's kind of keeping that snowball effect and keeping the ball rolling with her. So I can remember uh, almost the date of Campman Condit 2 eight years ago. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't remember 100%. I think you were in the corner of Kevin Lee on Saturday. Am I wrong? You were not. No, I... No, I was not. I helped Kevin out for some of the stuff with this camp. Um, obviously, Faraz is uh, in Montreal. Yeah. I don't think he was able to get back here. Uh, so it's kind of a weird dynamic. You know, it's like you got one guy trying to help you here, and then you got another guy back um, on, in Canada that really can't be here. Uh, but Coach Eddie and Coach Dewey cornered Kev. Uh, Faraz came in and, and did the head corner work and stuff. So, But uh, Kevin did a lot of his camp here, and, you know, um, it's it's just I think it's just hard because Kevin can be all over the place at times and and this this was nice because he I think he kind of narrowed narrowed some stuff down he had Sean Brady then that changed from a grappler to a striker and everything else so um, but man uh, you know I think the world of the guy I, I think sometimes he just doesn't follow the path that he should when it comes to winning the fight and he gets off track and I think that's what we saw on Saturday uh, I'll leave you with this is there a name right now who perhaps isn't being talked about isn't in the UFC or a major promotion that's at the gym that you're very excited about. If someone comes to mind, is there a prospect that we can look back on in five years and be like, ah, Eric told us about this guy or, or this woman, um, you know, when he was on the show in 2021. Yeah, we have a couple of young kids, uh, young up in covers. I got this kid named Kobe Farah. They, like um, he's this wrestler from Ohio, unbelievable talent. He's been working a lot with Jake Shields. You know, Jake Shields is now at the gym. And those guys have really hit it off. And then I got this kid, uh, Puni Pagoa. He's fighting for LFA. His his LFA debut was, um, I think, like a seven second knockout. So you got this classic Hawaiian striker. He's he can hit from both stances. He's really really good. And you have this classic wrestler, um, grinder, gritty kid. He's finishing his fights like old school Randy Couture style. And those two have really teamed up. And watching these guys spar and train together is only going to make them make them really sh iron sharpens iron. So those two really stand out to me in the gym. Uh, obviously, Ryder Newman, he's a guy that you saw on the show. Um, tough kid. You know, he's uh, he's been in the gym for a long, long time. So we're all pulling for Ryder. And, but, yeah, those are the guys who really stand out. Montel Williams as well. We've got another young kid that's uh, that's going to be fighting here soon. I think he's 7-0 and now. So a lot of good prospects you guys will be seeing out of Extreme Couture. And, and so Jake Shields, a full-time coach there now? Yeah, oh, Jake's here full-time. Wow. Yeah, Jake's here full time. It's a, uh, it's been a blessing having him in the gym and in the room. Uh, just the, just the wealth of knowledge that he knows, and he really fits our style of of grappling here at Extreme Couture. So he he fit right in, and and a lot of guys have been throwing him in the corner. And Justin James had him, Patchy Mix has him. So uh, he just another just another great coach here. That's great. Wow. And and you never fought, right? No amateur or pro, oh, sir. Wow, that's amazing. No, I actually. I got offered to fight uh, Ryan Bader, <laughs> and he was fighting on the local card here. Uh, Dennis Davis was, was, I think, maybe like the co-main event, and I was training a lot with Dennis. That was actually the first fight I ever cornered was Dennis. So the promoter comes in, and, and uh, you know, I was a big guy. You know, And, and Ryan, I played uh, high school football here in Las Vegas. Ryan played in Reno, so I knew, I knew of Ryan. And then the promoter was like, hey, you want to fight Ryan Bader? 
And uh, I was like, I, I don't know. It was like 2000 bucks or something. So I went home and asked my wife. And my wife was like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> like, no, you're not fighting Ryan Bader. She's like pregnant with my first kid. She's yeah. about to bust. She's like, no, this guy's going to break your neck. So, um, you know, I found, I found a, a carved a path in, in coaching. You know, for me, for a long time, it was hard because most of the great coaches that you knew had a fight background. Um, I remember in football, it was like I had coaches that never played football. And I, it was hard to trust them. But I think when you when you're when you're transparent and you understand that you have to really focus and dial in on every aspect of the sport, stay humble and not try to lie to guys that that you're going to build a lot of lot better trust rather than just saying, oh, I had 200 known street fights or make some shit up. You know, so it was important for me to be uh, transparent with with the guys. And um, I think it's helped. And and you host a podcast or something there because this is quite the setup you have. Uh, myself and Elliot Marshall, we have a podcast called Seconds Out. So it's been it's been good, man. I, I really like Elliot. Uh, Learn a lot man. from him. He's one of the great coaches. Yeah, he's the man. Thoughtful. So Elliot and I have a very thoughtful, great guy. So him and I have a podcast together. So yeah, I, I brought brought all the gear out for you. I love it. <laughs> I love it, man. Well, uh, continued success to you and the team. You guys are doing amazing things, and and like I said, you're one of the very best minds and coaches in the game. And uh, I'm sorry it took so long to have you on. I'm sorry it's under these circumstances. Again, condolences to the entire team on Kyle's passing, and we're going to do our best to shine a light on uh, what you guys are doing. And um, if there are any seminars or anything, I'd, I'd be happy to shine a light on that as well. So thank you again, Eric. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, man. All right. There he is, Eric Nixick. If uh, you're one of the very few left in this sport who is unfamiliar with his work, you better start to get on the uh, – on the bandwagon because he is doing phenomenal things and what a great story and what a humble guy what a down-to-earth guy um i can see why so many fighters are uh, are so happy to be a part of that team now and are so happy to be training at extreme couture in fact our next guest who should be joining us in a matter of moments um has probably some great stories about training with eric and the whole team at extreme couture i remember when it opened sort of in the uh you know the boom of mixed martial arts um, in the late 2000s, um, and Randy Couture being the you know former heavyweight and light heavyweight champion and such a big name in this sport, uh, it was a really big deal. It was a great gym, and they had a lot of big names there. Randy and Gina Carano, and as he mentioned, Jay Haran and Mike Pyle. Um, those were kind of the uh, the OGs. And then they hit this uh, this little rough patch. And things weren't going so well. Uh... And now they've completely turned it around. They've done a phenomenal job with the likes of Francis and Misha Tate and um, Aljamain Sterling training there and, and, and so many others. I mean, we can... Uh... We can sit here and talk about all their big names for a very long time. So uh, really happy to have them on and uh, wish the entire team the best. And uh, just some some horrible news uh, regarding Kyle Reyes. So I'm going to tweet out the, the GoFundMe page in a bit uh, after the show to direct you there. If you are interested, support the Fight for Boom as its title on the page. Uh, later on, we're going to be joined by Laura Sanko, uh, at four o'clock, we'll be joined by Laura Sanko to talk about her big night on the contender series. So stay tuned for that. A really big night for her, um, getting an opportunity to be the first female color analyst for a UFC event since UFC one, Kathy Long, first in the Zufa era. So she broke through that glass ceiling. No better, um, person to do that. No more qualified person in the sport to do it. She has paid her dues. I remember seeing her on the uh, Invicta days um, very early on and uh, saying, wow, this person knows how to be a broadcaster but also knows about fighting because she has actually fought before. Um, and so it's great to see her rise in TV as far as uh, UFC content is concerned. And uh, we'll also be joined by Marlon Cheeto Vera, who has that big fight also on the Madison Square Garden card uh, coming up on November 6th uh, in New York City. 
and I'll be answering some of your questions in about an hour's time on the okay um, I asked for some questions on my Substack page and so I'll be answering some of those um, at around 3.30. The On The Nose segment. It's sort of like On The Record, but it's On The Nose. Do you get it? On The Nose, On The Record. Who loves that? I love that. And we've got a bunch here, I see. I see, uh, let me see, 31 questions. Because you have to be a subscriber to ask these questions, okay? It's not just any Johnny Come Lately. The first time I did it, I had a bunch of Johnny Come Lately's you know, show up. Is this the right page? Yeah, it is. Um, but then we're like, you know what? There has to be some incentive here. So it's just for subscribers. 31 is enough. Probably won't get to all of those, um, but I will do my best. I'm looking forward to talking to our next guest. Uh, he is the reigning defending UFC bantamweight champion. I haven't talked to him in an interview setting in quite some time. I think the last time I spoke to him was he was supposed to fight uh, Piotr Jan in December, and then that got postponed, and it was around that time. It might have even been December of 2020, and then he ended up fighting uh, Jan, of course, in March. And, of course, we know what happened then with the DQ and everything, but he is the champ now, and uh, we just found out not that long ago that he'll be defending that title in a rematch against Piotr Jan on October 30th, in Abu Dhabi, that's going to air on ESPN Plus, not on pay per view. It's going to be one of those afternoon cards. Also on that card, Glover Teixeira going after the light heavyweight title for the second time in his UFC career against current champion Jan Bachovic. So two really intriguing UFC title fights on that card, and I'm very excited to welcome back to the program for the first time in a while the Funk Master, the UFC bantamweight champion, the one and only Aljamain. Sterling, there he is, also coming prepared with a really fancy microphone like Eric Nixick did. How are you, Aljo? I'm good. I uh, just finished up some PT work. I'm um, just getting everything strong for uh, fight day. I wish you were here in studio, Aljo. I'd give you a big old hug. Can we hug it out? Can we hug it out, Aljo? Where are we at? I love that you're here. Thank you. What, I, don't what? Know. I don't know what to think, man. I feel like, uh, I don't know. Well, tell me, tell yeah, me. Let's, like, and, like I feel like in a weird way, uh, you guys, you and DC kind of played a, uh, and I spoke to DC about this, but um, uh, I feel like you guys kind of done what the fans have done, look at something and kind of read a headline and then kind of ran with it, not really knowing the whole picture of what actually happened. And uh, I think that kind of helped paint the picture of me being the bad guy for his friends pushing a bell in front of his face to take a a picture with it, you know? So, uh, I, I felt like there was a lot of, um, misguided hate and it is what it is. Like the fans are going to think whatever they want to think, but I, I felt like when it came from, uh, that level, it, it kind of made it look, it kind of, it made me feel like, damn, these guys fell for that too, or kind of played into the, the whole headline game as well. That was kind of weird. Um, but here we are. Well, I'm happy we're able to talk it out. And by the way, just for the record, you know, a lot of people in this game, a lot of sensitive cats in this game, and there's a lot of people who would feel the way that you're feeling about me and who would say, to hell with you. I don't want to talk to you again. I'm gonna... So I have a lot of respect, and it's not just about me personally and coming on my show. It says a lot about you that you would, you know, come on and maybe not feel a certain way about someone, but still come on and, and entertain an interview and talk it out because I do want to talk it out. I, 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 re I appreciate and respect that. Now, you mentioned the headline thing. What do you mean by that? I, I'm being sincere when I ask. Like, because I watched the fight, I saw what I saw, and by the way, well, just you, to reiterate, I never question whether or not you should be given the belt. It was a DQ. It was illegal. It was legit. I never said you acted anything. It was only the aftermath that I was critical yeah, yeah, of. That's 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 what I was talking about, and the aftermath was partially um, of what happened when I got back from the hospital after being cleared that I had no bleeding on my brain. Mm -hmm. So everyone that said, "Oh, they you didn't have a concussion." CAT scans and MRIs of the brain don't reveal concussions. So for all my doctors out there, you guys are such idiots. CAT scans show bleeding of the brain, which is what I got because I took a shot. I did not see. They want to make sure I was okay. Everything was ruled out. I was okay. 
as I was in the hospital bed, I'm texting Dana White, I need to have this rematch ASAP until I tried to work out and I couldn't work out because of the atrophy in my muscles in my arm where the neck injury got a lot worse. I mean, for me to even get to where I've gotten to with this injury, honestly, I think it says a lot about my mental fortitude, but for people who don't want to say you faked the surgery that I was going to get win or lose, I was going to get the surgery win or lose. And, uh, unfortunately Jan was just stupid and whatever, but to go back to what you said, <laughs> your after your aftermath, yeah. not necessarily a headline, but to see the picture and think like, that's what I was doing, like parading around the boat, which is not what I was doing. I only started doing that when people started giving me shit for my friends and families telling me to take a picture with them. And because they posted it, I never posted it. I became the bad guy. And at that point I was like, so I'm going to keep explaining myself for people to keep ignoring what I'm saying. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to take pictures with the belt. Here you go. I am the champ because guess what? I am the champ. If you have a competition and you abide by the rules and the playoffs, the NFL, if it's overtime and you commit a foul and the illegal move, you get penalized. Whether it's for the belt, if people want to say you shouldn't be able to win the belt, then you shouldn't be able to win a fight because a fight is still a fight, whether it's a championship setting or it's not. You know, so I just needed to make it make sense. And then I could be like, okay, I understand where you're coming from. So whether or not there was a title on the line, the guy gets DQ'd. And I think it's the smart and right thing to do because guys are getting away with all these fouls. I was actually surprised that ref, I forget, I think it might have been Tyone, took a point. Um, from Sam Alvey's opponent and it took another point when he actually poked him in the eye again. I was like, thank God, yeah. because we're finally seeing people get penalized yes. for their actions. That stuff that they changed the outcome of the fight. So you should get freebies every single fight. That no. makes no sense. The first warning you should know? be in the, the locker room. And then the first infraction should be, it's like, you don't do a face mask in the NFL and be like, ah, there's your warning. No, the first face mask is a penalty. It, it, it's the most bizarre concept. Only our sport where we can say, uh, based on my subjective viewpoint, right. I don't right. think you were hurt enough for me to deem this a, uh, a no contest or a disqualification. In the words of John McCarthy, who was saying, you know, he's the gold standard of MMA refereeing, but this guy is saying he would have handled the situation differently. So the guy commits a blatant foul after you told him and you would have done it differently. So when do we ever DQ people? No, I guess. I, listen, I had no problem with all of that. And and honestly, the part that, as we're talking this out, I think this is good. It's healthy. I hope you don't mind. It was the Henry Cejudo face-off that rubbed me the wrong way because you literally said the day before uh, we're going to run it back. And then I understand you're but trolling. I said, but, but, here you, but here you are. What? You heard that I said that. So then why are you posting that? Because I saw, messages. The, I saw him at the hotel and I was like, let's take a picture together because it People are going to just be pissed. So then how can you get pissed by us getting pissed? You got the reaction that you wanted. But I never said this is the match that's happening. Well, it was like you said something like, oh, let's let's run it. You know, I'm I'm the money. I don't remember exactly. I said we could I said we could fight soon. You know, so there's nothing wrong with me saying that. But that didn't say that was the next fight. I already said what the next fight was. So when people started doing I'm like, man, you guys, it's too easy. This is one is this got us. You're good. You're a good troll then. You know, but. It is what it is, you know. People and then it was like the to... WWE video, and then you really leaned into it, did you not? I mean, you <laughs> <laughs> did you not lean into it? Like you did, we were trying to get us upset. Well, at that point, people were hating on me for walking around with a belt that I never walked around with. I'm like, yeah. I, I'm confused. <laughs> I left the belt in the cage. It showed up at my house, and I'm being trolled. You know what? Let's flip the script and get people more riled up. Let's fl- let's. Fan the flame a little bit, you know, if this is what people are going to give me shit for, I might as well have fun with it instead of trying to, no, I'm sorry, guys. It wasn't, uh, screw you guys. Like, go fuck yourself. That's, that's how I felt, you know? So it's like, you want to play hard nose, hard ball with me and try to make me feel bad. Dude, I worked my ass off to get to this position. I got no handouts. I fought a killer's role of guys, three guys in the top five, beat them all, choked out the guy that's supposed to be the next guy that ended up losing again, still making the same mistake. Like, this division is one of the hottest divisions, and for me to get to where I've gotten to, uh, I like to think I did. I'm doing pretty good in life. You are. Now, so, uh, you are. Let's just have the rematch, and then we can shut everybody up. You know, I know the Russian fans really love their guy, which is Aljamain the Funk Master Stone, <laughs> and I want to make sure the Russian fans have someone to cheer for, which is going to be Aljamain Funk Master Stone on October 30th. You know, so I want to make sure all the Russian fans love me. How would you describe <laughs> the last five months for you? Like, because it has been a little bit. You know, you were always kind of like a fan favorite, right? And you had this nice relationship and 
Then you have to deal with all of this and the next surgery. And, you know, like there's a lot, there's a lot that's happened in the last five months for you. Has it gone too much at times? Has it been a little overwhelming? No, nah, I would say the only thing that has ever bothered me was like, sometimes you wake up, and you're just not in a, in the mood. And then you see something, you're just like, yesterday was fun to entertain us right now. I just don't feel like doing it right now. You know right. what I mean? Like at, at some points you do get tired, like any other human being would. Um, but other than that, uh, nothing has really bothered me than just trying to get my body back into shape. And that's honestly the most honest thing I could say. You know, that's why I was kind of hoping for the fight to be in December. Uh, just so I can have a little bit more time to recover. Uh, there's some lingering issues. And this is just me being honest and transparent, which I'm always am with the fans. And uh, you can say whatever you want to say. He's backing out or making excuses. Dude, I had a very serious neck injury. And yeah. I lost a good amount of muscle. And I'm trying to rebuild, re what would you call it? Repair, rebuild the nerve damage that happened in my arm. And uh, it's better but to say it's it's where it was before a couple of fights ago, that's would be just straight up lying, you know. But like I said, I fought with limitations plenty of times. I know a lot of people have other limitations, whether it's their hand, their wrist. So this is just part of the game. You know, this is part of my journey, my story, and I got to figure out a way to win with what I got, you know. So um, I'm just trying to do what I can within this time frame to get my body to where it needs to be so that I can perform the best I can perform. Because I truly do believe I'm honestly better than – Pidiano. I'm not saying the guy's not good. I'm not saying he doesn't deserve to be in a position that he's in. He's a tough dude. But being in there with that guy, knowing how I felt the day of, I, I just truly feel like if that's the best version of him, and this is me being honest, if, if I felt like he was really like kicking my ass and I could not do anything if we had 10 fights, that's a problem. I would openly, openly admit that, hey, coach, we got some stuff we need to work on. But I truly did not feel like that. I feel like I beat that guy eight, nine, nine, eight, seven, eight, nine out of 10 times. That's my personal opinion. When I'm on, I feel like that guy doesn't even touch me, you know? So, uh, like I said, I'm not trying to downplay the opponent. I think he's a very tough dude, but I feel like when you're in there with someone, you kind of know what you got. And if that was the best PD on and he couldn't, that was the best he could do with this guy who was standing in front of him, who was pretty much a walking corpse. I was a walking corpse just throwing these pitter patter punches that had nothing on it. I couldn't put anything on it. I was like, dude, this is all you're going to get out of me right now. And if that's all you can do, when I feel good, I like my chances. And that's, that's pretty much it. That's why I'm like, I hope the fans are excited for this fight. Because if, if I were to make the same mistake I did in the last one, I'm just a complete moron and I deserve to get my ass kicked. You know, so I can honestly say that. But I, I truly do think I get my body right. It, I'm going to be a problem for this guy. Okay, so a few things there. Fascinating stuff. What are or were the mistakes that you made in that fight? Could you tell us? Like, let people can say this is weird all they want. I truly did not eat anything the day before the, the day of the fight. I, I had two eggs, two pancakes, and that was it. I know people are going to say, but you said you didn't eat. Like, that's not a proper nutritious meal to go in from 10.30 a.m. to 8.30 p.m. fighting and not having anything else in that window. So if you think that is adequate fuel for a 25-minute fight, you're out of your, mer your, your, your bird and you've never competed at a high level. Um, Why didn't you eat? Were you not feeling well? So, so we normally are allowed to leave to go eat, but because of COVID, we had to order food to the hotel. And I just had the UFC PI team give me the food that they recommended I ate. And that was all I had for breakfast. And I'm not saying they didn't give me other portions of food. They gave me a lunch and a dinner portion, but I only eat one big time. And then I fight a couple hours later. So for this time, I didn't quite understand how much later I was fighting in the day from what I ate. And then by the time I realized like, yo man, I'm starving, but I, I can't eat anything because it's too close to the fight. It was a little too late. The ship has sailed, you know, for me to eat a full thing, I would have probably puked all over myself in the cage. And I still would have felt like shit, you know? So hindsight's 2020 and even feeling like that, I talked to Ray and I was like, knowing what I could have done, like just watching the fight in hindsight, I could have maybe been a little bit more calculated, spun less, uh, shoot for less takedowns and it would have been a very boring fight you know so it's um it's it's a catch-22 you know it would have been a more boring fight people probably wouldn't have been excited for the rematch and um i would have probably got the the win but it would have been a very very boring fight you know a lot of circling just staying long touching trying to point score you know and my mindset before that was 
if I could win three rounds, I win the fight. Last 10 minutes, it could be as boring as it wants. Just hold him to his leg and hug him to, to, hug him to death, and you're going to win the fight. And that was my mindset going in. Three out of two, I win. And uh, it just, you know, whatever. It got ugly, 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 and it got ugly. Any concern? You mentioned, you know, you wanted December a little more time. You did come off neck surgery. Any concern that you might not be ready for October 30th? Yeah, there's always a concern about that. Um, I'd be lying if I said it it wasn't. And the only concern really is that I'm not going to be at the best that I could have possibly been in. Like like I said, this surgery has been night and day, like from sleeping at night, not waking up in the middle of the night with neck pain, nerve pain, uh, numbing, tingling down my arm, uh, and actually having some, most of my strength back. It's been great. Like even today we did some work and I've already come up a couple of pounds Um from what I did on Monday, you know, so uh, the stability is finally starting to come back and hopefully we could just get the nerves firing the way that they should fire. And uh, this way I could perform, you know, it's one thing, like you just don't want to fight knowing that you could have done more or knowing that you could have been in a better situation. And I think that's the most important thing. Cause I, you know, win or lose, I'm not going to get another shot for a while unless I just take out a killer's role of contenders. Um, or, you know, even if a, with a win, I'm still going to be in the same position trying to get my body to where it needs to be, you know. So um, you never want to go into a fight not feeling like you could have. You never want to go into a fight feeling like you could have done more, but you were limited physically, so you couldn't. And that's what the, that's been the the theme of a lot of my training camps, having to take three, two, two days off, three days off, a week off, because I would get bad stingers in my neck. And when you have to sacrifice that much downtime from training, you – you kind of start to wonder like what you could have been or what you could have done or how much more you could have learned and worked on. So I'm just trying to take everything day by day. And uh, I'm truly excited for the, for the rematch because I, I just want to pull the talk to rest finally and give some people new stuff to talk about. Cause like, yo, this material is getting old. We've seen this <laughs> story one too many times, you know, why, why do you think you wouldn't get another crack if you lost? Like, why would you have to go through a murderer's row? Because the story of my career has been, how can we keep Sterling from getting a title shot? You feel that way? That's what it's, that's what it's felt like, okay. you know? And any for anyone to say it hasn't felt like that, I think you have to kind of look at everything I've had to go through just to get to this position, and it's uh, it's pretty fascinating. Um, the, it's no secret. I think it's fair to say that the UFC has their favorites, the people that they think can do certain things. And, you know, they have their war room where they, they – put everything out and lay it out like they think this person might win. If they win, this is where everything's going to be, kind of like a spider web kind of thing. And um, I don't know, if, after I come in, I don't know if it's because I talked about fighter pay before when I was a free agent and, you know, when I was a teacher and I was like, yeah, I could have been making more money as a teacher. It was the truth. I, I don't know if that kind of rubbed them the wrong way about me or whatever it was, but it's... Uh, that was like seven I, years ago. You th You think they still remember that? Dude, you never know, man. Yeah, I know. You never know. I, I mean, take that, it from me. They hold be... grudges, Aljo. I know for a fact. Well, you're, you know, Ariel, you, it might be deserved on your end. <laughs> well, how, oh, really? How yeah. so, Aljo? How so? From, Do you tell. From how I hear, from how I hear the story. Oh. Like the breaking the news stuff. I don't know. And, Let's go. You know, I. Let's go. I, this is, I don't know the whole details. Who's your so source? Brendan Schaub? Who's your source? Well, I just heard it from um, Joe Rogan talking. About oh, that. Joe Rogan. Okay. Let me say once, it, can I can I clear the air for the 50th time about that one? What Joe Rogan has spewed is 1,000% false. What Brendan Schaub has then parroted is 1,000% false. Rogan's source is Dana White. Brendan's source is Joe Rogan. I think you know me long enough. I think I, Quinta, and Ray, and Chris, and everyone on the team know me long enough, regardless of anyone else you want to talk if someone tells me something off the record, and I'm sure you've told me things off the record, if I go out and report it, I should be done. There is no way that I would practice that kind of journalism and still be here yeah. 13 years later. If you tell me something in confidence and I report it, I should never be talked to again. I should be outlawed. I should be banned from covering the sport, any promotion. That never happened, the story that Rogan told. That never happened, the story that Brendan talked about a couple of weeks ago, 1,000% false. And in fact, it's very damaging to my reputation because that's the kind of stuff that a hack journalist does. I'm not a hack journalist. 
I got that the same way I get any piece of news, confirmed it with sources. Not a single person ever told me, don't report this. We brought you in a corner. That that whole BS story that Rogan spewed and has somehow been like regurgitated and recycled is a lie. It almost makes me wonder what other things Rogan is lying about on this show, but that's a different story for a different day. All I'm saying is that's a 100% lie and very irresponsible for a guy like that with a platform like that to talk about me like that without knowing that side of the story. The only reason why he told that story was because Dana White was trying to justify the stupid banning, and then they went out and tried to make me out to be the bad guy. So that's a lie. Produce another story where I did that. You ain't going to find one. So I just want to say nothing is justified in terms of my situation. That never happened. Don't listen to those guys. You feel me? No, nah, I, well, I will say in Rogan's defense, he, I think I'm pretty sure he does clarify, like, this is what I heard. And yeah, if this guess is what? what That's a stupid this. fucking reason to say a story when you're talking about someone's career, right? This is what I heard. This guy went out irresponsibly and is dealing with the repercussions. No, no, no. Find out the truth and then come talk about it. I'm sorry I get fired up about it, but you can understand as someone who has dealt with the repercussions of people speaking irresponsibly on your behalf, it's a stupid freaking reason. And and Brendan, for regurgitating it five years later, I've had my own issues with him. In fact, he just reached, I'll break some news, he just reached out to me this morning, Brendan, and apologized to me for regurgitating false lies, false lies, that's, a, that's, that's, re, that's redundant, about me. And I said, thanks for reaching out, Brendan. I look forward to you doing it on the air the same way you you said lies about me. You should probably go on the air and and apologize and rectify. So I wait for that day. Until then, God bless. Well, that's that's good. That's that's making ground. I I, I mean, I, I guess when people have a podcast platform in general, when they have news is kind of like the talking point. So I don't know. Maybe I can't say if it's right or wrong because I think every person is different, but um that does clarify a lot um because again i don't read into the tabloids of everything because it's like you never know like you see a headline and you start to judge people i think it's the, the craziest thing you could do because you don't know about anything right. you're just hearing all hearsay so i i tr try to live my life and like that's that. actually why i was bummed because i felt like hey maybe i was wrong as we tie this back to you maybe i was wrong maybe i was unfair now you know like part of the gig that i'm in dc's in anyone like you're, you're asked to give your opinion, but I've always yeah. tried to be fair and I've always tried to be, you know, ethical and down the middle. And if it's not so good, you say it. And if it is good, you say it as well. I think 95% of the things that I say are positive and uplifting and helpful towards fighters. But sometimes you kind of have to say it, you know, like it is. And I do hope, you know, like I never said you didn't deserve the belt. I never said you were a faker. I never said that, you know, that was acting or anything like that. It was just the aftermath, which like, look, we can all have takes on each other's personality or how we be. But in terms of the actual competition, I was 1000% in agreement with how that thing went down. Like you just, the rules were broken. And as a result, the rules state you should be the champion. So anyway, I, I'm happy that we're able to somewhat clear the air here. I don't know how you still feel about me. I mean, the fact that you're here at least is good enough for me. You don't have to be my best friend or anything like that. And to go back to the previous, but like, have I ever wronged you prior to any of that? Have I ever like, did you ever feel like I stabbed you in the back or said something that you told me not to say? Did that ever happen? No, not with me. No, I couldn't say that. No. So there you go. So we're boys. I, I, I will say one thing about that whole faking and, a, a concussion uh when, when you get blasted in the face like that unexpectedly in a position where you think you're safe and i know mighty mouse has given me shit about this too and then he proceeded to i think the very next week to get knocked out um <laughs> with a with a knee That's um true. that was crazy how Palmer, that happened Palmer has a very mysterious ways of working and i'm not saying like he's a bad guy but it's like you talk shit about a position that you train yourself. If you are in a fight and you take a bad shot and get stuck and a guy has your head and he's planted his hands on it and you just get up blindly and get blasted in the face, you deserve that. If I take a bad shot and you stuff my head tactically and strategically, you should wait till you have a clear path to get up safely. Now, if you're going to try to tell me I'm stalling the fight because I don't want to get up because I'm trying to get up safely. I think there's some type, some type of, uh, I think something's probably off in your head. That that's really what I think because I'm like you're trying to tell me I should have gotten up in that position where I could have just gotten my clock cleaned and then boom, 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 the fight's over. No, I think I'm a pretty smart fighter. Even though I'm exhausted, I'm going to take my time and intelligently get up so that I can show that I'm still trying to stay in the fight. 
Now, people were saying that I was rolling my eyes and everything. I got hit. I was confused. I got blasted. So if you're saying that was an active performance, I get five minutes to recover. So if, if I want to lay down on the ground instead of standing up and being all dazed and confused, I'm going to lay on the ground because I've done that before where I got rocked and try to stand up and you fall right over. You just It's just not the smart thing to do. So I sat on the floor. I laid down. I'm trying to recover. And again, I'm exhausted. And I've admitted this multiple times. So the ref is supposed to give me my five minutes. The doctor came in. As he was checking me, he thought it, the five minutes wouldn't be sufficient enough and called the fight. That's not on me. And as one, I don't think fighters should be put in that situation to feel like you get, you need to carry the warrior shield. Ra, you are a warrior. You're Anthony Smith. You're a Lionheart. Oh, my God. I can't believe you're amazing. You took an illegal shot and you continued. What a warrior. No. That's absolutely stupid. Let me let me blast him in the head with the knee, and then we can continue with the fight. How about that? The same way I couldn't see it, let me let you close your eyes, spin you around a couple of times, and blast you in the head, and then see if we can continue the fight. I, I I get so confused by the logic, and this is why I just troll, because it's like, dude, I can't speak reasonable. I can't have a reasonable conversation with some of these people. So I was like, you know what? Just now the Anthony, the Anthony Smith thing is crazy. I, I I've said to him till this day that he should have taken the belt. Like, you know, you can't go to the bank and, and deposit, you know, warrior spirit that like, that doesn't happen. So that could change your life forever. So I agree with you hundred percent about that. And his knee was nowhere near the same as mine. Mm -hmm. Nowhere near the same as mine. Mm -hmm. um, I want to ask you one last thing. Cause I know you have to go, uh, you and Matt, Sarah, you guys cool now? Yeah, we've been cool. Okay. I know there was that little thing and you had the video, but any chance he corners you or is he still retired from cornering? That still remains to be seen. <laughs> Hopefully. All right. I, I'm, I'm hoping he uh, comes out for this one because um, that was always the plan. And I've spoken to him about it before making the decision. And I spoke it to him after that whole thing came out. And, uh, and I told him, like, I honestly didn't think it would have come to a situation like that where he would have felt that hurt. And uh, it was more so me doing kind of what he told me, like, do what makes you feel the most comfortable because you're the guy going in there to, to battle. And, uh, you know, I did what I thought was right um, in terms of the COVID situation. We had to only bring our people that we can work out with, you know, and Matt was just, you know, he was doing his thing and uh, he was more afraid about the COVID than a lot of us were. So it was just kind of one of those situations where I was like, well, I kind of need you here, you know? So if, if it's going to be a bother, maybe we just wait till the next fight. Mm -hmm. And that was always the, the, the plan, at least of my intentions, you know? So um, I think things kind of just got maybe lost in translation or maybe the fight week kind of made things a little bit more real. Yeah. Where it seemed like, yeah. oh man, I'm not in the corner, you know, and I should be there kind of thing. So I don't know if that's what it was, but um, this is just me just talking yeah, out yeah. loud, you know. Well, by the way, one uh, I was surprised. Like MSG is the following week. Why aren't you on the MSG I, card, New Yorker? I still can't fight in New York still because can't. the New York State Commission won't change the ruling. You know, I had a CAT scan on my brain where I actually have two spots on my brain where where it's like blood. I don't. They don't know if it was dry or if it was like active. So in order for me to make my debut in Las Vegas. I had to get a CAT scan and then they had to monitor it every six months and after every fight for a couple of years. They did that and then they kind of just stopped doing it because the bleeding pretty much stayed the same, you know, so nothing changed. You know, there's no anomalies uh, in my brain where I would need to have surgery to continue to uh, compete as an athlete. So um, I'm not the only fighter that has happened to it. It's just the way they have their rules in the medical side or something, the way it's written. All they have to do is just get someone and change it. I think it just might be a money thing, <laughs> as always. Or that sucks. Does, isn't that a bummer that you can't room? fight in your hometown? Yeah, I've only fought in New York as an amateur. Right. So it's kind of shitty. Man. Well, uh, October 30th, Abu Dhabi, the rematch. Hopefully hopefully you continue to get better. You're healthy. You're good to go. Hey, man, I really appreciate this, honestly. I, I don't know if we accomplished anything here, but just the fact that you would come on, um, means a lot. I respect you greatly. I hope you know it was never personal. It's just talking about the gig. And I and and it's this is like for anyone. Like I always say, if you have a problem, I'd love for you to come on and we could talk privately. We could talk publicly. Like life is too short for grudges. So I think it just says a lot about you that you would come on. I I think people tend to um because I I get a lot of tweets sometimes saying like, oh yeah, I know you're bothered. I'm like I, I don't think people understand the type of person I am. I don't, I'm not one to really hold grudges, even against family. I've had a lot of situations where I probably should. 
And um, I'm just not like that, you know. So do uh, you have an issue? You have an issue. You talk it out, whatever it is. But I kind of tend to get over things relatively quick. So um, maybe for me, it's water under a bridge. You know, I, I just, like I said, I said my piece on it, and that's all I had to say. Yeah. And other than that, you say what you say, and I'm like, okay, at least you understand where I'm coming from. I and I understand where you're coming from. And whether or not we agree, that's whatever. But um, I have no problem, you know, so – I'm always going to be a, a fan of the sport and obviously a fan of your work and other journalists out there and stuff like that. So if something bothers me, I just feel sometimes you just need to say it. So that yeah, doesn't... for sure. Don't let it bottle up inside. Yeah. And thanks for hearing me exactly. out about that other stuff. I apologize. I've actually, I don't think I've ever said the F word in my entire career on air, but it gets <laughs> annoying. As you know, when people are saying things that are wrong, that are lies, that are bold faced lies that are damn yeah. like I could live with someone saying you suck as a journalist. I could live with someone saying like that was a bad interview. But when you're saying that I'm doing something unethical and it never happened, like it couldn't have even been anywhere near what they're saying, like a total fabrication. None of it happened. And they have a platform like those guys do. It's annoying. And I think you can sympathize with you probably more than anyone could probably sympathize with that. So thanks for hearing me out. Oh, awesome. Thanks. Yeah, for no for that. Uh, all the best. Looking forward to the fight. Aljo, you're the man. Thanks. All right. Talk to you guys later. All right. There he is. Aljamain Sterling, the funk master, kind enough to join us, the reigning defending UFC bantamweight champion. And yes, it's true. I am sorry. But uh, listen, you, you hear all this stuff. I mean, it's constant, you know, people trying to, t and I know some of it might be rooted in jealousy or just, you know, trying to take you down. But man, again, I could handle anyone saying you're a hack. You're a bad journalist. You suck. Your show sucks. Your questions suck. But don't lie about my practices. Don't lie about my ethics. Because I've tried to be as legit as possible throughout my entire life. Maybe, you know, you could question things here or there. I've talked about the Fox thing. But on my life, no one has ever, ever told me something in confidence, off the record. No one. I can't even believe we're still talking about this five years later. And I have defied that. I have broken that. You know how many times I have been told something off the record in my life, in my career, 15, 14 years. Do you know how many times that has happened? I have never. You think I would still be friends with Daniel Cormier, with Chael Sonnen, with Chris Weidman? Do you think these people would come on the show if I broke their trust? Never happened. You think I would have ruined my standing in the sport for one story that nobody, no one even would have remembered that I broke that story if it didn't go down afterwards the way in which it did? No one would even cared. We wouldn't even be talking about it. So to say that I was brought in a room and I was told that jobs and livelihood and all this meshugas happen, it's all a lie. It's all 1,000% a lie. 1,000%. And while we're talking about lies, Brendan went on his show and talked about me being a nightmare to work with, me being a bad teammate. He's heard from a million of different people that I'm the worst to work with. Talk to my colleagues. Talk to my friends if that's the truth. Talk to the production team if that's the truth. I've worked very hard to try and be the best teammate and colleague possible. Possible to help people out along the way. And so again, talk about me being a bad journalist all you want. Bad show all you want. But don't talk about what's inside here. Don't question the kind of person that I am. Try to take me down because you may be jealous or because you have some other bizarre reason for talking about me as a person when you don't even know me. I don't go personal. I don't talk about you like that. I have nothing to do with you. Leave my name out of your mouth, especially when you want to lie about me. You want to talk about my show being great? You want to talk about me being the 10-time journalist of the year? All you want, but don't lie about me. Don't talk about how you, uh, you, you gave me gigs, that I should be thanking you. Don't lie, because I will come after you. I will respond. And so I did get a text from him this morning, and I said, I appreciate it, but now do it on your show. It's very easy to uh, apologize privately, be a man, and do it on the air. For the lies about 199, for the lies about me being a bad teammate, for the lies about the, the, the Jake Paul fight, be a man, stop lying, stop making up stories, and apologize on the air. And he said he would, and I'm looking forward to that. Stop talking about me, because those guys have been doing it for a long time. And I know what it's rooted in, but high road Helwani ain't no more. You're looking at the Helwani era.
All right? This is independent Helwani. I ain't taking those shots anymore. So everyone better know, if they come at the king, you best not miss. Marlon Vera is next, and I'm happy that he's next so I could cool down here a little bit because enough is enough with this garbage. All these people spreading lies, rumors, all this crap. It's all lies, and I've had to sit there and be the bigger man for a very long time and take the high road because when they go low, I'm supposed to go high. Those days are over. I just want to let you know. Those days are over. You're going to call me names. You're going to call me douche. There's no one telling me to shut up anymore. There's no one telling me to take the... Uh, you know, the road less traveled and be the better man, be the bigger man. Those days are over. So you best be ready. And you can ask a couple people from the past week if I'm a man of my word, because I will go right after you. I will hunt you down. I will make a beeline towards you and I will talk about it man to man, face to face. And then we'll see what's what. Zoom machine, Marlon Vera, Cheeto Vera, the man, one of my favorites in the game. You feel me, Cheeto? You feel me? What the fuck is going on, bro? <laughs> Who the fuck is talking about you? Tell them to go and fuck yourself and suck some cock. Tell them. <laughs> You're a free man, brother. Tell them. Cheeto, my Tell man. Them what's up? Enough, what's right? Up, How are you, you can only take so many shots. At some point, you got to stick up for yourself, right? I take no shit, bro. If I have a problem with you, I punch you right in the face. <laughs> I mean, there's a middle finger. You have to be like that. There's a middle finger in your Twitter bio, for God's sakes. Who's you that? Have to. What's up, bro? That's a Pat, Pat Tenori. That's Pat Tenori kid. Oh, shit. what's up, man? How what's happening? Going? What's happening? What's up, Chito? I just what finished training. Did you need an interview? Oh, my bad. All right, <laughs> see you guys. <laughs> uh, I just finished training. I finished training. Uh, cool down, stretch, and fucking shower for you. Oh, nice and clean. You're the man, Cheeto. Uh, it's great to talk to you. We found out a uh, big time fight coming to New York. You versus Frankie Edgar. How did this one come about? Um. Well, initial plan was uh, me and Cruz in October 30th. Uh, I guess Cruz was looking for something bigger, brighter, and nicer. But you know, it's the the matchmaking makes, you know, it's almost perfect match. Like, there's nobody available right now. So, whatever, you know. I, I said this before and I will say it again. I don't chase no man. I'm not desperate to fight anybody. I'm a fighter. You pay me. That's a number one, number two. You know, if you pay me, I fight. Uh, Well, the fight fell through. He didn't took it. Um. And then they told me, like, hey, look, uh, we know, you know, Frank is another good fight, but we have different plans. And they did tell me about it. Like, they, this is the fight that we were offered to Miami. And I was like, cool, whatever. Like, you know, what I can do about it. So I was like, I've been training pretty consistently. I've been in shape for, you know, any day. I told them, like, hey, if you ask me, I fight anybody in the top five, of course, because tell me upstairs. I find anybody in the top 10 because, of course, you enter to it, you know, you get a big reward. And I was like, hey, to do not make your job harder. If you want me to fight a fucking on rock guy, whatever, just call me. Just call me, give me a day because I want to fight. I want to be active. I don't like this one fight a year. This, you know, I like three, four at least. And, you know, I, I'm guessing the closer you get to the top, the, the harder it is to get you the right fight. And I was like, you know what? Cool. You know, just call me with a name. I don't make your job harder. I'm not. I'm not here trying to, you know, make this play this diva thing. Like you gotta pay me four mil. And like, I'm gonna make the money. Just give me no fight so I can earn my money. And they told me like, hey, this fight might fall through. You want it? I was like, don't even ask me. You send me papers. And they sent me papers. Wow. Now you beat Sean O'Malley. Does it bother you that they went to him first? And then you're getting the fight after it didn't work out with him? Not at all, bro. You know, it's life. Opportunity is up when you prepare, you know. You know, just imagine I'm, uh, you know, I'm powering, I'm fucking around. And then they call me like, hey, he, he took it. I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm all fat. I'm <laughs> doing like shit. No, I've been training. I can fight tomorrow if you 
it, 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 to be honest with you, but they call me. I don't, dude, I don't know why fighters, we are fucking fighters. Why they are so sensible? They're like little bitches. Like, oh, you called me after him. Like, Fuck off, dude. Man up and just do your fucking job. <laughs> they call me. I was like, Fuck yeah, bro. I appreciate you. I sent a, a, a thank you message to, to, to Sean Shelby, to Honor. And I'm going to give a big kiss to that in the forehead when I see him. I'm like, I appreciate the opportunity. It's just, what they gonna say is true. This is not a fucking job. This is a fucking opportunity. It's only, what, 600 fighters in the whole roster? Right. Fucking live life. Enjoy it. You know? Stop complaining. And start making. But this is this is a really big moment, my friend. I mean, this is Madison Square Garden. This is a legend. This is, uh, you know, one of the all-time greats. This is, I would say, I this is the biggest it. moment of your career. Would you not agree? This is, this is, this is the moment of my career because when I signed for the UFC every year, because they come once a year, you know, before COVID, it was once a year in my son's Square Garden. And I swear to God that I would close my eyes and just imagine they calling me my son's Square Garden, big fight. And this is, this is the moment of truth. You know, this is the moment that I have to fucking show up and, fucking drill this guy and send his head to another dimension. And I'm very excited. I'm very happy. And, you know, I fought at this level for a, for, for, for a long time, you know, check all the fights I had, you know, I fell short in song once I, I stopped song once and this is the moment, you know, it, this, this is not about who I'm fighting. This is about where I'm fighting and I'm going to perform. I'm super happy and good thing. I was, I've been in shape this whole time, so I don't have to worry about if I get tired, if I'm overturned. I'm, I'm in great shape, uh, and I'm feeling great. I'm, this is the moment. This is a great moment, and this is my moment. I feel like if anyone can appreciate this moment, it's you, because you're such a fan of the sport and a student of the sport. Like Some people are like, oh, yeah, whatever. I'll fight at MSG. I'll fight in North Dakota. I don't care. But like Madison Square Garden, right? What a special place. Oh, Frankie Edgar. All the greats. Right, all the great, the box, the boxing, boxing, UFC, like can be a bigger moment. You no, know, when Connor what a, what 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 is at the top of the game, he win the belt there, and that's about MMA. You know, it's it's a great it's a great opportunity, and it's in my hands to make his his story for my country. You know, first Ecuadorian to kick ass in the Madison Square Garden. Wow, Ooh, boy, I'm excited. That I'm is amazing. Excited. You're coming off a great performance fight of the night against Davy Grant. Prior to that, you had the tough fight against Jose Aldo. Did you feel pressure going into the Grant fight? You know, I don't want to lose two in a row. I need to get back on track. I need to remind people that I'm the man, that Cheeto's the man. I was on this winning streak. How are you feeling going into that one? Yeah. I was ready, man. And like any other fight, you know, you're nervous, you know, thoughts came to your mind, but I can't. In preparation, in the gym is when you are like fixed all that mentally. And this is such a mental game that you just have to be set and ready. Like, their thoughts came to my mind, like, fuck, you lose again. You you know, in this game, you lose one and you're like, oh, we knew and you suck. You know, there's a bunch of opinions, but again, I don't give two fucks about nobody else's opinion but the people that I love and the people that care about me and they, 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 they fix their mistakes for me with the hard work I put. So there, there's thoughts going to, to the mind. When I was in the locker, I was like, this is about it. And my my goal was beat the fuck out of this guy or finish him. And I did it. I was like, I ain't making this uh, back and forth fight. Like, you know, I you almost win the run. I almost win the run. That's why I was, I was tired at the end of the fight because I emptied my gas and trying to kill him. And I told you this one thing. There's no way I got I can be tired. We all get tired. But if I'm tired, you're dying. The way you train, the way you run, there's no way. There's no way. There's just no way. And that came from this fucker right here. I love it. It's wow. a different mindset. It's, I'm a fighter, man. I'm a fighter. I love to do this. And I take my job seriously. And, you know, it's tough. They give you, they give you a big opportunity with Aldo. And if you go and watch the fight, you know, first round, you probably give it to him. He swing harder. Second round, I basically took all his energy. He was pretty much done. And that was causing me the fight. I got too excited and I and I end wrap around in a, in a in a bad position. If you go and watch the fight, I wasn't just chilling trying to get choked up. 
I was trying to give the mount like an escape. I was trying to escape. I stand up twice, slam and I try. Like if you see who fight more, I fought more. I got it. He made the point. He was on my bike. Good for him. There's no excuses. My only thing about that fight, you know, it was my fault for getting excited. And, you know, I wish I had the, the five rounds I deserved coming to that fight. I think I, I, I really thought I was getting a five rounder with him. And in a five rounder, I would probably make him cry. But, you know, it is what it is. I cannot complain about it. I accept it in the very, in the very moment. I was like, fuck me. It's my fault. Go back to the drawing board. And I knew they would, they, they would sit me around because which other fight makes sense after fighting number five, like, you know. That's why they give me a rematch with a guy that was on a really good win streak. I was the one that was getting nothing. Right. But at the end of the day, it's life. You got to dig deep. You got to, you know, learn from your mistakes and just make it happen again. You know, you cannot live in the past. You know, it's one fight at a time. One thing that I've noticed, uh, Cheeto, and, and correct me if you feel otherwise, I feel like you've really come into to your own, like your style. It, you're not the same Cheeto Vera that we first met in the UFC, like even the, the longer hair, the longer facial hair, the, the clothes you wear, like you're just a very cool guy. Can I just say that Marlon? You're a very cool guy. I, I, I respect your style greatly, but this has come over time, right? You weren't always, you were like clean cut. You were sort of looking like everyone else, but now I feel like we're seeing the real you come out. Is that, is that a fair assessment? I, no, it's very fair, dude. It's very fair. A lot of people, Marlon, girl, I'm just, as an athlete, growing up as a fucking man, like, think about it. When I made it to the UFC, I fought a couple of tough Brazilians. I fought a couple, like, I fought around South America. That 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 helped me grow in some balls, being away from my family, going to Jackson's from the Ultimate Fighter uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. But I had no fucking experience, man. I have, when I was training in Ecuador, like, you wouldn't even believe the way I was training. I wasn't training like a fight. I was lifting weights, running, and sparring my best friend, because there's no, even today that the sport grow, and there's a couple of Ecuadorians that are going to fight in contenders, and they're my friends, they're fucking sweeters, they're, they're going to make it, I know they're going to make it, but they had a better, they have a gym, they have a big people around them, helping them, but the, when when I started, I was training in the living room, so it was hard to come off the shelf, because I was like, what? I, how I fight, I'm, I thank God most of the time, because I didn't even belong there in my first couple of fights. I was like trying to figure it out how to fight. Then, you know, I'm blessed with a, you know, pair of balls, you know, and commitment. I was, I was a, dis I'm a disciplined guy. I'm consistent. So I try harder than other people. That's why I keep my job on the go. How many fighters came, lose couple and they're gone. I lose couple and I was like, okay, let me figure this out. I went from London when I lost my David Grant fight. With my manager, flew to his house in California. I was like, okay, explain me how this should be. Like, I didn't have any idea how this works. But again, it's no one's fault. It's life. Either you learn or you just fall in the hole and don't come out. I came out of the hole. And then I become myself. You know, I I figured it out. I made a couple of questions and, you know, you live and you grow. It's the only thing you can do about it. And I'm very jealous of you, Cheeto, because you got to train with the legend, Action Bronson, Bam Bam Baklava. You got to feel his power. What, what is my fucking guy right there. <laughs> he's the best, right? I mean, That's it's amazing my... what he's turned. He... What a force. I love that guy. That guy and the, the good thing about Action is, like, he's a fucking sweet. I like, start, started with, we, you know, he called me, like, hey, I'm coming to California. Let's, let's catch up. I was like, ah! <laughs> so, so we went to, we went with our boy big boy we lived some weights of course you know i'm a i'm a bunch of which i had you know baby weights those fuckers were going crazy <laughs> and it's just like you get to meet the people that you know that you look up to and it's fucking dope like and then now it's like we home is like you know come to california we hang out we fucking get high we work out we get high again we work out and you know the guy surf too, so it's like it's not like you just meet somebody that is the opposite of. You. It's like meeting somebody that lives the same life you live. You know, eating clean, working hard, and just like not just talking about it, like being about it. Like you know, he's he's not posting pictures, just training. I train with that guy, 
we, when we came back from Vegas from the corner weekend, we get we, we drove back from Vegas, we get to Venice Beach to the place he was staying, and we look at each other and it's like, you wanna get you wanna get a workout in? I was like, fuck yeah, dude, I'm not scared to work out. We did like 500 squats, swings, and then I was like, fuck, dude, <laughs> you wanna be around people like that? Yeah, you don't wanna be around people that is a step below and they wanna keep you below. You always wanna be around people that lift you up, that you know, they keep you keep you strong, make you harder, make you like better. Like you don't wanna hang out hang out with people that don't wanna get better. I always surround myself with people that it it is it, it, they're doing better or they wanna do bigger. This is the only way to grow. If you are with, you know, low level mentality people, you're gonna fucking eat shit. You want to surround yourself with people that leave you up. I love. And that's it. what I do. I love it. I love it, and I could see that. Oh, here you. What you want we? you want a couple words from this guy? Who's this guy? What do we got? Oh, this is the man right here. Oh, there he hey! is. The man, Jason Perillo. How are you, How are you sir? Doing, I'm doing great. How are you? How are you? I'm doing well. We're Amazing, just. Amazing, man. It's great to see you. It's great to see I you too. I saw you doing boxing. Yeah. How about that? Right. Pretty cool, right? You can do it all, man. We're all grown exactly up, Jason. Great, baby. Maybe you could teach me a few things. Come down. Where are you at, Canada? Oh, Canada, Jason. I'm in New York City. I was actually just talking to someone named Samoa Joe, who says he goes all the way back with you, back in the day in the OC, the great WWE star. Yeah, Samoa Joe's a great friend of mine. That is amazing. You actually trained him or trained with him? Yeah, he came in. I've known Samoa Joe since we were young, man. He's a great dude. Okay. He lived not too. He lived. He lived right. We're not too far from here, re realistically. Okay. Yeah, he's a great dude. Oh yeah, you were with Rick Lee, yeah? I was with Rick Lee in Vegas. That's right. Yes. Are you doing an interview with this guy? Yes, I am. Just a couple of minutes left. Why? Do you need him? Oh, are you in the middle of it right now? Yes. <laughs> I thought you just. I, I thought you answered all your phone calls right there. I thought that's just how you. <laughs> no. On yes. Phone. And on my set, here I am. <laughs> Uh, hey, he's going to do great against Frank Yeager. We're excited, man. Yeah, what a big fight. What a big opportunity. What's the game plan? Tell us right here and now. Dude, we're stick and move, stick and move. Yes. No, well, well, I, we, we cannot reveal, just like right. your, your your mighty Canadian, yeah. George St. Pierre used to say, we cannot reveal our game plan. There you go. Fair enough. Hey, it's great to see you. Great to see Ariel. you. All the best. Continue to success. Proud. You're doing great out there, bud. Thank you. Good for you, man. Thank you very much. Take it easy. Uh, I'll, I'll, so I'll ask you this, Marlon, and then I'll let you go. Is Frankie the same Frankie, or do you feel like you know Father Time has caught up? Obviously, you're preparing for the best Frankie. I know you're going to say that, but like when you see him, honestly, do you feel like he has lost a step? Like, you know, you gotta you, you gotta keep it honest. You know, you see things and everything, and yeah, he's getting older. You know, 39 years old is not it's not a fake. You know, right. you're 39. You know, it, this is a young people sport, but at the end of the day. It doesn't matter, you know. If you get caught in there, if you if you get loose in there, anything can happen. So I prefer, and I mean, the, I told I told you this before. I, I I don't act tough. I prefer to fucking battle to death. I prefer to be fucked up, being dropped mentally. I fuck. I'm, I'm guessing I'm fucked up mentally because I'm thinking the worst. So I can expect the best, you know. If he comes like you know, I don't know. 2.0 Frank Gallagher at almost 40 years old. Good for him. At the end of the day, I'm training to 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 fucking battle. And when I say I don't give a fuck, I don't give a fuck how hard it gets. I'm gonna dig deeper, you know. So whatever he's doing, good for him. I'm I'm prepared. I'm well rounded, and I don't get tired. So I don't know what else I, I can say about myself. But I'm. I'm gonna come ready to fight. So we're gonna meet in the center, or we're gonna move around. Doesn't matter to me. I can fight going backwards. I can fight putting pressure. So I'm in good spirits, you know. I'm, I'm feeling good about it. And then that guy that came earlier, Orillo, he made me click a bunch of things that weren't clicking before, and you know, that's the main reason I moved full time with him. I thought, I thought. I we were training for a long time before I moved full time with him, and now that things pass and time pass, I felt I shouldn't make the move before. But you know we cannot go back in time. But that's the man that is going to make me a world champion. Wow, I love it. And I don't know if you you saw, but after your last fight, I said I predicted 
this man will fight for a belt one day, a UFC belt one day. So. I saw, uh, and those are the things I appreciate because you've been, you know, the nose has been around long enough that you can know, you can smell things. So when I saw that, just make me come back to the gym thinking about it for the first couple of weeks and I was like, fuck it, you know. I'm 28. If it's going to happen, we're going to make it happen soon, you know. I'm not going to wait till I'm, you know, 38, 39 to be like, fuck, I should do this, should do that, or when retired fighter says I should keep a better diet, like, I'm doing that right now. I'm not waiting till the end to be like, I should be more disciplined. All in now until the end, then when it's over, then I can fuck around, you know, who cares? I love it. Good luck to you, my friend. Always great to talk to you. I, I, I'm happy that you were the one after my little rant there because you brought me down. Uh, you're, you... Oh, what What happened? Who are you talking to? Uh, uh, let, let me ask you the question because you were like going, oh, <laughs> tell to my face, I'm not a fucking little <laughs> kid anymore. But I was like, oh, oh, what's going on in here? Hilwani, Cheeto. Hilwani is here. It's a new era. No one's talking smack to me anymore, all right? And if you're going to talk hey, smack, you're going to get smacked people, back, dude. all right? Hey, fuck people. They're like, that's why I don't, I can talk shit online, but I, I used to say with it. If, if we're in a fucking six feet apart of distance and you talk shit, trust me, we're going down. That's why I don't, I don't, I don't need to pop my chest all the time. Like, I just like, you know, if you want to get down, we can get down. There's no, I have no issues with that. So you got but, my back, hey, right? You got my back. I, I, oh, if we're, I was a guy when I, when I was a kid. If my friends get into a brawl, I was the first down. The first. I'm not talking about brawls. Kid. I'm not. I'm, I'm not. I'm a lover. I'm not a fight. But uh, you know, enough of the disparaging I'm a lover my name. Too. Yeah, yeah. I'm a lover. I'm a hippie too. But you know, if somebody gets in my nerves, I'm like, I'm not gonna walk away from war. You know, you know, like, you know, like the buffaloes, they don't run away from the fucking storm. They fucking go at it. Right. Amen. Awesome. You're the man. Don't run. Don't run away. Marlon. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. We'll talk to Thank you soon. You. Good luck in training. November 6th, Madison Square Garden. Frankie Edgar, Cheeto Vera. What a fight. What a card. Wow. So many great fights on that card. Uh, always great talking it's to great you. Thank card. you for giving me some time, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, bud. Appreciate you. All right. There he is. Marlon Vera, one of my favorites in the game. And I did say after his last fight against uh, Davy Grant, I'm trying to get my shoes here. It's getting a little comfortable. He will fight for a belt one day. All right, great stuff. Uh, 30 minutes, we're going to be joined by Laura Sanko, who is flying home after her very, very memorable evening in Las Vegas, uh, becoming a color analyst for the first time for a quote-unquote, I don't even know what to call it. Is it a UFC event? Is it not? You get the point. It's contenders. First one since Kathy Long, UFC one. So she's going to be kind enough to join us. But for now, let's go to some of your questions. Ooh, I can't wait for this. On the nose. Soon we need to get like a little theme song here. You know, we used to have Rick's Picks theme song and all this stuff. So maybe we'll get to that one of these days. Um, in any event, da 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 um, I just laissez le bon temps rouler, and uh, we'll see what we come up with. Uh, these are from the subscribers on my Substack page, arielhawani.substack.com. Okay. <laughs> and by the way, you could go; they're right there for you, so you can see that I'm picking them pretty much in order. Uh, the <laughs> the, <laughs> the first one is from uh, Brandon. Schlub. Um, and uh, he writes, <laughs> um, oh God, geez, really? Listen, it's there. So I got to Okay. This is a genuine question. No matter how I worded this question, I honestly have no opinion on what you did, but I'm curious of what you think regarding the Brock Lesnar return, which you leaked one hour before the UFC. Now I want to, I want to correct you, Brandon. I didn't leak anything. I reported it. There was no leak. There's a big difference. If someone tells you, hey, in an hour, we're going to do something. And then, you know, you're like, okay, cool. And then you go out. That's a leak. This is not a leak. This is a reporting. No different than what Woj does or Schefter does or Bob McKenzie does or any of your other favorite, you know, journalists in any other beat. So get get your terminology correct. One hour before the UFC was to reveal surprise promotion video. Oh, by the way, I didn't know that they were revealing it. By the way, don't care. Doesn't matter. 
doesn't shouldn't affect your reporting, but I didn't know that for the record. If you spoke to somebody at the UFC and they asked you not to spoil the surprise because we have a cool promotional video that we're going to show in an hour, would you still have broke that news when you did? No. Great. This is a good question. No, of course not. You know how many times people have told me I've got this video, I've got this news? Like, I don't know. Uh, you don't think I knew about CM Punk? Like, just for example, off the top of my head, because I see he's in the news right now. Like, of course I'm not reporting things that people tell me things off the record. You know how many times this guy told me things? Think about how many times he told me things that I didn't report. Like, if someone's telling you something in confidence off the record, you don't report it. That's one-on-one stuff. So, yes, if, if someone did tell me that, of course I wouldn't. But no one did. Guess what? No one did. So all you other BS YouTube accounts that like to regurgitate old things and somehow this became a story again five years later, please do this one too. No one told me not to report it. No one said off the record. No one told me about a video. No one. Zero people. Zilch. Nada. No person. Goose egg. Rien de tout. Tu comprends? If you say yes, can you explain the difference between what you did and what Tony Schiavone did? By, okay, well, I don't say yes. So you're comparing that to the Tony Schiavone putting butts in the seats? No, it's not the same because I never agreed to that. I was never told that on my life. On my life, I was never told. Now, who are you going to believe? Who are you going to believe? Tell me, who are you going to believe? You're going to believe Bapa? You're going to believe me? You're going to believe P.F. Changs? You're going to believe me? I think we all know the answer to that. Greetings, Ariel. Happy early Labor Day. Been listening to you since you were a frequent guest, 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 frequent guest with John Pollock back in the Fight Network radio days. Being a longtime fan of the show as well as live audio wrestling, how long have you known John alongside Jason Agnew and Dan the Mouth Lavransky? The Law was truly one of the best shows in Canadian radio as it revolutionized pro wrestling and MMA coverage. This is from Jake Alinar. Great question. Loved The Law back in the day. Uh, Jeff Marrick was on The Law back in the day as well as a host. Tremendous uh, guy and broadcaster now doing Hockey Night in Canada in America, excuse me, in Canada for the CBC and for Sportsnet. Uh, John Pollock, one of my favorite people that I ever met in this business. Like I said on Monday, he was one of the first ones to actually shine any kind of light on me. Um, put me on uh, Fight Network Radio alongside Mauro Ranallo, reached out to me. John is the man. As straight of a guy as you'll ever meet. Straight shooter, honest, down to earth, ethical. Just, I consider him a very good friend. Um, and his his buddy, Wei Ting, his co-host slash co-owner of post wrestling they're doing amazing things over there uh, i always listen to the podcasts and i used to love the law days after a big wwe um pay-per-view they would be on sunday they'd be on every sunday but it was especially fun after a big wwe or wwf pay-per-view um and i know jason agnew is now doing his uh sunday night's main event great job and and the mouth appears as well. And I know they kind of reconciled recently. So that was great. Meltzer's on. It's great. I mean, it's, if you're a pro wrestling fan, you got to listen to post wrestling. And I would also say, check out Sunday night's main event. But yeah, that was an institution. And uh, I loved it. Who would be on your ultimate all time fantasy UFC broadcast team, including yourself, if applicable, that's from David. I mean, I can't put myself in there. I've never done UFC, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. Now, boxing, boxing, uh, that's a different story. Just kidding. Just kidding. Everyone calm down. Um, man, all time. That's tough. It's hard because Goldie was the, you know, the soundtrack, um, of, of the UFC for so many years. I think Anik has become one of the best broadcasters in combat sports, not just MMA, extremely prepared extremely well researched his attention to detail is second to none you know the way he learns how to say everyone's name the right way with the the the, the right pronunciation gives people that respect that's a really big deal um a really really big deal so it's hard to go all time if, can i do my favorite right now i mean i think the i think they got it right with with uh with uh, Anik and uh, DC and Rogan, it's a fun broadcast team. I, honestly, look, Rogan doesn't do the uh, he doesn't do like the fighter meetings and things like that. And I think you miss a lot. I'm just being honest. I think you miss a lot when you're not talking to the fighters beforehand. Now it's weird with the UFC 
he was the man on news radio and then he's on fear factor and it was almost at one point like he was giving the ufc the rub and then the ufc was giving him the rub and now he's back to giving the ufc the rub so what a journey has been and i think there's a place for him and i think he makes things feel bigger and so i have no issue i know some people like to criticize but i i have no issue but i i do think it's good now the way it is where it's like all right he does the pay-per-views but then for the fight nights and the other shows you get Felder and Bisping and Dominic Cruz and say what you will about the UFC and the production staff. Like they have very rarely, if ever found lemons, like dating back to even the Kenny Florian days. And when Randy Couture would show up DC now and stuff, um, they have very rarely swung in and, and missed. They usually for those spots do a really good job of pinpointing who would be good on air and who would be good for a seven hour broadcast. And there are none like, I'm like, Oh, this guy sucks. Honestly, I'm not just saying that because I know a lot of them. They're all very good. And it's a tough job, man. It's a really tough job. It's really, really tough. So for the most part, they've done a really good job. You know, sometimes for the pre and post fight shows, they throw some people out there who are a little uncomfortable, but that's a good sort of, you know, proving ground, a place to learn and hone your craft. Um, so, yeah, I would go with the team that they have now, to be honest, um, as the pay-per-view team. And, I think it's fun when it's like DC and Cruz, DC and Bisping. All right. Um, Iman O'Keefe. Ariel, I have two questions. If Jake Paul sticks exclusively to his model of fighting just MMA fighters, who do you think would be a reasonable bet for his next fight? Do you think the UFC would let a Masvidal or GSP step in and fight him as Dana would want to shut him up? No. Uh, I just don't think that they want anyone to say like, oh, you know, Jake Paul versus UFC. Like the Woodley thing was different because he was a you now former UFC fighter. His contract expired. I mean, it couldn't have happened at a better time. The stars aligned perfectly for that one. He was in the locker room, all that stuff. Um, it just aligned perfectly. But no, the UFC isn't offering anyone up to fight him. I don't think so. Unless they're like a part of the pay-per-view or something. And I just don't see that happening right now. I wonder what he does next. I wouldn't be surprised if it's Tommy Fury, to be honest, because so much attention was put on that one. Um, so I, I actually wouldn't be surprised if he takes a break from the MMA gimmick for a second, fights a Fury or someone like that November, December. And then we got Nathan Diaz, who's saying he wants to fight Vicente Luque. I mean, could you imagine this time next year if Diaz's contract expires and we're getting Nathan Diaz versus Jake Paul? I mean, like I think that's the biggest... I think Nathan Diaz versus Jake Paul is the potentially biggest potential fight. Did I say potentially biggest potential? Um, I've been spending too much time on the uh, on the Reddit pages, if you know what I'm saying. Um, is the biggest potential fight that he could make in the next year. Like, he's not fighting Canelo. He's not fighting, uh, I don't know, anyone in Canelo's orbit. I was trying to think of another guy who is around 185, 190. Like, no, he's not fighting any. He's not, he's not fighting a Terrence Crawford. He's not fighting any of these guys. I heard the people talking about Canelo and stuff like that for Jake Paul. Are you crazy? What is wrong with you? He's not fighting those guys. I mean, if we learned anything on Sunday, it's that A, he's a fighter, but B, he's still very raw. Like, he's still only 4 0 as a pro. Like, there's a lot more to do, and we'll see if he wants to stick with it. But I think if it were up to me, fight Tommy Fury next get that win over the boxer and then Nate Diaz, Nathan Diaz next year. Honestly, if you were offered a full-time gig as an NBA sideline reporter, but it meant you had to stop reporting on MMA, would you be able to turn that down? I would turn that down. Uh, I love MMA. Um, I love doing the sideline stuff, but honestly, it was great. Like I got the 14, 15 games. And if I never do it again, I'll be okay. Why? You know, if I'm being honest, you fly out, you leave your family for two days and collectively you're on the air for like five minutes. Now I loved it. Don't get me wrong. I absolutely loved it. There wasn't a moment where I didn't love it. And there were moments where I like, I can't believe I'm on the court here with, you know, Kawhi Leonard and Luka Doncic, but you know, you're, you're sitting around, sitting around and you get like a 45 second hit. And then you sit around, sit around like, I like to talk, you know? And that's why I had so much fun on Sunday. Cause I got to talk and the interviews were longer and I got to be in the booth for a little bit. So I'd love to do it again. Don't get me wrong. But if it was, hey, you have to do this and leave MMA, no. I can't leave MMA. I have to stay here. You guys need me. I wouldn't be able to do that. Who is the greatest Australian MMA fighter? This is from Sudesh. Robert Whitaker or Alexander Volkanovsky? Oh, my. 
That is a tough one. Man, that is a really tough one. Oh, my. Um, right now, I'll say... Well, Volkanovski had the longer winning streak. Can I say the jury is out, but if I had to pick one right now, I think Volkanovski. Tough one, but I think Volkanovski. Ariel, this is from Scott. I'm a longtime fan. Been listening to you since you had a call-in show where Nick Diaz fan would constantly pester you. I have to finally know, when you look at your career now, are you the taxi or the Uber? Ah! <laughs> that is a great one. Damn, Scott. With a deep cut. That is in reference to after I got banned, uh, my good friend, my pal, who I have no problem with, but I'm just telling the story, Robin Black uh, referred to himself as the Uber and me the taxi. Uh, at my lowest, I'm banned. And for whatever reason, he felt like it was a good time to kick me while I was down and call me uh, 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 a taxi and him an Uber. And so I'd like to think that I am a limousine, a stretch Hummer, baby. All right. One of those with the little TV signal thing on the back. You know that where it would pull up to Monday Nitro and you wouldn't know who's coming out. And then the shoe comes out and it's a fancy suit. And there's the nature boy, baby. That's me. Um, oh, Sudesh comes back with another one. Uh, is Alexander Volkanovsky the most underrated champ in the UFC? Yeah, I could, I could see that. I mean, let's go through the champs. Um, Francis, not underrated. Jan, maybe doesn't get the love, but got some, I think, after Izzy. Um, Izzy, no. Kamaru, no. Getting the love for sure. Oliveira, okay. Case to be made, but I, I think... Olvera gets more love than Volkanovski. Aljo's in a weird spot. And then Amanda Nunez. And then uh, 145, 135. Valentina, no. Rose, no. So yeah, I think you can make that case. I get the feeling um, that Sudesh is a big Volkanovski fan. Sudesh comes back with another one. If Robert Whitaker beats Adesanya in the rematch, Adesanya, will he establish himself as a pound-for-pound -pound great? Sure. I actually had Robert Whitaker in my pound-for-pound -pound when I was doing them for ESPN like towards the end. He's awesome. What are your thoughts on open scoring? Do you see more states adopting this process in the future? I want to see it at least tried out. What? Okay, what's the worst that happened? A, it doesn't work out. But B, like this this notion that like, oh, this person knows that they're up to, oh, and they're not going to fight. That's ridiculous because you can apply that to football, basketball, and like they get around it, right? There's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. You can be penalized for stalling, for evading, for all that stuff. Like, I think that there could be something to it. If you know you're about to get robbed, maybe you'll do something differently. Now, can you say like, oh man, you're down. Like, what if Tyron Woodley knew? What if he knew, right? Let's take that fight. What if Tyron Woodley knew that he was down six rounds to one going into the eighth? Maybe he puts the pedal to the metal. He doesn't live with that regret. Now, does it mess up their psyche? Maybe they only find out every, like, maybe not every round. In boxing, different. It's a longer fight. Maybe you only find out in MMA going into the third or going into the fifth of a championship fight. I don't know. But I would like to see it at least tried out, tested out. I would like to see people get that opportunity to, uh, to know where they stand going into the fifth round of a title fight. This is from Kelly. Have you ever considered being the man to organize fighters' pay? I think you might be the one person in the entire world who could actually pull it off. No way. Are you nuts? That's not my role in all of this. My role is to talk about it, shed a light on it, report on it, but I don't know anything about labor unions and things like that. That's that's not my job. Um, Morris. Ariel Hawani gets to play God with each of PFL, Bellator, and One. What is the most impactful single change you would make to each to supercharge their growth? That's a great question. I think a really big thing is to have a face, a face of the promotion who's going to promote and do it in an honest and genuine way, but with, with excitement and passion. Look what it did for the UFC with Dana White. You know what I mean? Like I said this recently about AEW and wrestling. Like Those fans want to run through a wall for Tony Khan, and they support him. And, 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 and they're like trying to galvanize AEW to beat the big bad WWE. We don't have that in MMA with any of the other promotions. They're all just kind of there. And I know it's different. You can't have, you know, 
Kayla Harrison on every PFL show, like you can have CM Punk on every AEW show. I know it's different, but you need to get like, who's the face of PFL? Is it Ray Seffo? I don't even remember the last time he did an interview. And that's a weird situation in its own right, because he's like holding mitts one day at Extreme Couture, and the next day he's like standing in between two people who are fighting. Like, how is that even working out? Who's the face of these promotions? Does Coker still have that fastball? Does he still want to be the guy to pound the pavement and get the word out about the promotion? You know, Chatri's doing his job, but I think sometimes with Chatri, people are like, oh, is he being honest? Is he telling the truth? Is it 5 billion people, 4 billion people? You need a face. You need a promoter. You need a guy like an Eddie Hearn. Look how people get behind matchroom boxing. I'm very excited about Katie Taylor returning this weekend. That's very exciting. So, like, you need a guy or a gal to get people riled up. That's what I would start with, to be honest. And then I would try to find out, like, all right, what's our identity? And, oh, oh, oh by the way, like, less shows. Less is more. You don't need to do 30 shows. You don't need that many shows if you don't have the roster. Do 10 shows. That was the, that was the, 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 the brilliance of Strike Force. They did like 10 shows, but every show was great. And it catered to the local market, Bay Area. Don't just throw it out there and be like, ah, oh, we're going to, you know, have 30 shows and we're going to go here. We're going to random cities and random cards. Identity, voice, less is more. Those are important. Hi, Ariel. Uh, do you have a theory? This is from Will. Do you have a theory as to why Dana White in the UFC seems to be signing way more fighters each episode of the Contender Series than he did in earlier seasons? In the first few seasons, he would sign one or two fighters per episode, but last night he signed five from four fights and for the first time ever signed someone who lost a fight. That never used to happen. P.S. How long have you worked at P.F. Chang's? One day, baby. One day only. CEO, CFO, CEO. Yeah, my theory is like, to just put it bluntly, like it's 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 young, cheap talent who are willing and able to fight whenever, wherever, however, short notice. It's a great factory. It's a great thing that they built for themselves. They're getting paid for it. It's on ESPN Plus. But yeah, they were definitely a lot more selective. You know, it's great to have those young guys on. And I think he even alluded to this, like to have those people ready to go, chomping at the bit, COVID times, fights are falling through. You need those, that's why the, the roster ballooned. You need those, those young cats ready to go. How close to complete are the Oliveira Poirier, Moreno Pantoja, and Diaz Luque fights for UFC 269? And is there any reason why they haven't officially announced it for Las Vegas? This is from David Woods. To the best of my knowledge, none of those are close. Diaz came out yesterday and said, like, I want you, Luque. But that's not close. Now, usually when Diaz goes after someone like Leon Edwards, as far-fetched as it may be, and this one isn't far-fetched because Vicente Luca called him out, he gets what he wants. But that's not close. But he does want to fight in December. Uh, Olivera Poirier, I wrote that in my substack that it was a possibility, but definitely not close. Now, I heard that they want to do potentially Francis Ngannou Cyril Ngannou in January, so it needs a main event, and Amanda Nunes versus Julian Pena are probably not going to be the main event. It's the last one available, so you kind of have to like figure it out by process of elimination. But not close, and same with Moreno. And the Pantoja thing is so funny. I, I saw uh, someone say that, uh, I, I, I was saying that Pantoja deserves the title shot over Askarov because I can't interview Askarov. Like, are you kidding me? Really? I didn't even know who Askarov was managed by. I mean, like, get over yourselves. Ridiculous. That's not how I roll. You might be unethical. I'm not. I say it like it is, all right? I sit here and talk about Anyone from any, I don't, I don't care about that stuff. I truly don't care. You don't want to come to my show? Great. I'll talk to a gazillion other people. Um, Matt L. Say Patty the Baddie has a dominant performance on Saturday. Does he get on the mic and call someone out? If so, think he'll aim inside the top 15? No. I think he'll just be so hyped. He'll talk about the bonus. It's been a long journey for him. Too soon to be calling people out. Uh, Daniel Hamilton. Do you think of Francis Camaro in Israel, since all close friends stood up as a group to improve fighter pay by some sort of protest, would get traction? Yes, I do. Those are three champions. Are you kidding me? Of course I do. Uh, BK. Hi, Ariel. Fantastic job on the broadcast over the weekend. Thank you. When Connor fully recovers from his injury, do you think it would be a mistake for him to fight Poirier immediately and risk losing three in a row? personally think he should take somewhat of a tune-up fight first. Take on someone like Tony Ferguson, or perhaps Nate Diaz afterwards. If all goes planned, then fight Poirier. Yes, don't go back to the Poirier well. If only because we've seen it twice in a row. I'm not saying he can't beat him. We know he did back in the day, but don't go back. You know? Someone new, someone fresh. Ferguson 
there's a good backstory there. I don't mind that. It's also going to be a year before he returns. So, you know, it's very like, who knows, you know, who knows where we are. Um, Brandon, uh, did you get a chance to thank Brendan for turning down the Showtime gig so you could get your foot in the door? He's a great guy. Never met him though. Again, you know, I saw that clip yesterday and I tweeted something. Those who knew, knew, and, uh, it's not true. It's just all, that's all I'm going to say. I'm not trying to start. He texted me this morning. He apologized. And I'm only saying this because if it was a personal thing, I would keep it to myself, but apologizing privately for something you said publicly doesn't fly. You got to do it where you did it the first time. And that's damaging to me. Don't lie. That's it. Just say, ah, oh, it didn't work out. Like why do you have to lie about it to make yourself feel better? I don't know why. What would, what would inspire someone to lie in that moment? I don't get it. And look at Josh Thompson there trying to stir the pot. Big bad Josh Thompson. Um, so yeah, don't lie. That's all. And so he reached out and he apologized. And it was a very nice apology. It was. But I said I would appreciate if you did it publicly. And he said he would. So I believe him. I have no... Have you ever heard me talk about Brendan Schaub on this show? On any show in a negative way? Knocking him? I know there are people out there who do... I don't do that. I want everyone to succeed. Actually goes into the next question. What was your interaction like with Luke Thomas when you saw him last week for Showtime? Very, very good. We had a couple of conversations, long ones. And I think we're in a great spot. And I think he was told some false things and he wanted to say some things to me. And uh, there were some, you know, some things that were misconstrued. And uh, I got to say my piece. He got to say his piece. And we shook hands. And then we went to eat together. Like, I'm in a good spot. In, in this new era that I'm living in, I want no drama, no beef, no no bad blood. I want everyone to succeed. I want all media to succeed. I want everyone in the sport to succeed. I want everyone to be happy and go to their family and be healthy and happy. That's what I've learned coming out of the pandemic. And I've always kind of been this way, but especially now I don't want it, but I'm also not going to let people lie about me and attack my character. It's not going to happen anymore. I'm not going to take the high road anymore. So if, again, you want to criticize my work. Great. You want to criticize my interviews. Great but you're going to start making things up and lying about things that didn't happen because you think you could get the rub and think you could get over on me because I'm not going to reply. It ain't going to happen. And so I'm happy that all, you know, I'm able to clear up all these things. I'm back out in the, in the wild. I'm back in the open. And uh, I feel really good about where I'm at with Luke. And uh, we were able to uh, talk about a lot and I didn't have a beef or a, a hatchet to bury necessarily, but not to say more like, I have a lot of respect for him. I think he does a great job and I'm very happy for his success with Showtime and with Brian Campbell, who's a great guy. I've never had an issue with him. Um, and so, yeah, I'm happy for everyone. I am happy to uh, see everyone succeed. There's enough room for all of us, enough room for all of us to be successful and to eat, as they say, and uh, to then do a job and go home to our families or our friends or whatever. And just end of the day, we only get one life here. Only get one life. And at some point, we're all going to be old and irrelevant and gray. Why waste any time and energy on this nonsense? Beefs, jealousy, rivalries, meat. Like, no one cares about this media crap. I mean, maybe you guys do because you asked me so many damn times about it. But the point is, I'm not going to let anyone try to assassinate my character to get themselves over. He want, he doesn't play like that. And so with that in mind, speaking of being happy for people, speaking of feeling joy for other success. It's a beautiful thing when something happens that has nothing to do with you and you feel just genuine happiness for someone because they achieved a goal. They achieved a dream. I would urge you all to live life like this. Be happy for others. Be happy for teammates, for colleagues. Because guess what? When you, when you shine that light, when you shine that light, Good things happen to you. It's it's a, it's a strange thing, but good things happen to you. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And so with that in mind, I was so happy when I saw that Laura Sanko was going to be a color analyst on last night's Contender Series show. Not only a color analyst, but the in-cage 
announcer and also the backstage interview. She did three jobs last night. I hope she got triple the pay, for goodness sake, uh, because it was a, a tour de force. But I know the color analyst job was, uh, was really special and something that she wanted. She deserved it. She earned it. And I'm really happy that she's the first one since Kathy Long back at UFC 1 to get that opportunity. So I do believe she is standing by. Let us go to the magic of Zoom and say hello to Laura Sanko. Hello, Laura. How are you? Hi. I'm doing great. I'm doing so great. So, so great. <laughs> I feel <laughs> like you have you that. Me on. I feel like you have this smile like tattooed on your face. Like you can't even not smile if you tried. <laughs> It's a hundred percent true, and uh, it was obviously I was I was hearing what you were saying <clears throat> for a minute or two there before uh, I came on air, and it's just so true. Like uh, appreciating other people's success, and it was funny because watching watching you shine last week, or I guess earlier this week, I'm kind of losing sense of of all space and time here. It was a busy day. Uh, I don't know, really put me in the space of like being grateful for. Uh, what I had already accomplished and yeah, I don't know what to say. I'm just, I'm super, super happy. It's, it's kind of one of those things that maybe people who aren't in the MMA world wouldn't think was necessarily a big deal, but it, um, it is to me and I'm just thrilled. Oh, and we are thrilled for you. And I think you saw some of the reaction online, like so many people genuinely happy who you've never met for your success and that you got the opportunity and I'm sure that warmed your heart. And, and by the way, I want to note, like you just landed, so I'm not going to keep you very long, but I did think that this was a really cool thing to celebrate. So I appreciate you doing this. Could you tell us yeah. when you found out, because you've been pushing for this and you haven't been shy about it, respect to you. And sometimes that goes, that goes one way or the other. Like if you're open about something, some people yeah. get upset, but you weren't shy and I got respect for that. When did you find out that you were going to get this opportunity? Um, I found out at about six o'clock the night before the fights. Oh my God. <laughs> So like 24 so, hours. Yeah. So I had actually already flown. I left Kansas city. I had packed, you know, as I'm going there to, to do my normal duties reporter, um, and, and in ring announcer and all that. Um, and I got, uh, a text from Dana while I was in the air and he said, Hey, are you in town yet? I said, no. He said, come, please come see me when you land. And those texts are so <laughs> terrifying because you just you just don't, you know you just never know you just never know when the boss calls it's it could be great it can be bad i mean who knows it could be anything in between so um i went and i i i went up to his office and uh he said hey i just want you to know that um we've seen the work that you've been putting in we know that you've been wanting this for the long for the longest time and i have been very vocal about it i think sometimes that maybe got a little bit under certain people's skin, but it was something I kind of felt like I had to, to do when appropriate. And then um, he just said, yeah, he said, so you want to call the fights tomorrow? Wow. And I said, what I actually said was, fuck yes, I do. Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh, he said, he said, listen, we can, I know this is super last minute. We can push it off next week. Uh, I don't know if you're prepared for tomorrow. I said, no, 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 no. Good. I got this. We're good. We're good. We're good. Good yeah. on you for not saying uh, push it off because you got to take that opportunity. Eighty percent of eighty percent of success oh. is just showing up, in my opinion. Uh, and you showed up. Now, was there any talk of you maybe not doing all the other jobs as well? Because that's very unique. <laughs> I mean, Jesus Christ, you're running all over the place there. Yeah. So, what a lot of people don't know about the Apex is, especially for Contender Series. Obviously, on Fight Nights, they are cage side at the Apex. But for contender series, because they're very, they want the contender series to have a different feel, a different look, different lighting, different logo, all that stuff. The, the commentators sit upstairs in the building and it is the most, it, it, it is an absolute uh, maze of hallways to get anywhere in that building the way it's built. And then you also have to go upstairs and go through another maze of hallways. So there was, that was the immediate concern was like, I have to, as soon as a fight ends, I have to figure out how to gracefully take my headset off, uh, get out of this very cramped booth. Like I had to, Dan Helly had to physically stand up. They had to move some chairs around and I had to run with a production assistant uh, through these hallways, down a flight of stairs, through a bunch of other hallways, through the doors, and then around the octagon <laughs> to, 
to get the scores, which is part of the reason there was a bit of a score snafu because we had to add another layer of someone who could tabulate them for me and then hand them to me. And there was a bit of a miscommunication there in, in terms of how they needed to be written out. So regardless, uh, I'm hoping that they're going to change where we sit because I'm not going to lie. Like I was running up and then as soon as I was done, of course, I'd get off the octagon, go to the interview and then run back upstairs and then run. Down. Right. <laughs> so it was so much. It was so way, much. I don't mind doing all three, but I mean, it's just a the, lot of, sort of, yeah, it's a lot of mileage. It's a lot. Why don't you do the interview in the ring? I think it's just another thing where they want contender series to kind of feel different. I guess there's, there's a lot of, um, the phrase that gets thrown a lot around a lot is like, they got, they got to earn certain things like that. They want the fighters. They don't want the fighters to feel, I guess, like, Oh, you're in the UFC now. Like this is, this is a great stepping stone. It's a potential launch pad if you show up and show out, but like, the in-cage interview, the cage side commentators, I mean, I, they try very hard, deliberately to make it look and feel different, I guess, is it. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah. assuming you'll do the entire season? That's the plan, yes. Wow. And, uh, yeah. you know... Every week. <laughs> amazing. We are our worst uh, critics, right? I mean, like, it's, it's, it's tough sometimes. It's, it's hard for me to watch shows or listen to shows of mine because uh, I cringe at times. How do you feel you did? Are you happy with your performance? I am happy with my performance. I think um, so many things that happened leading up to this really prepared me for it. First of all, I had to do an Invicta show last year on six hours notice, the morning of the fights. Wow. So, and that was nine fights. So, and, and that was another opportunity where I really thought, man, I know the UFC is going to be watching this. If I go in there, I completely shit the bed. It, it could really hurt my chances to doing this for them. But I thought, no, I just, I have to go for it. Like, I know I can do it. And I went out and I hit it out of the park later on. The LFA situation happened again, less than a day's notice. I didn't, I didn't get to talk to any of the fighters. I wasn't part of fight week or participated in the firefighter meetings. I was watching fights as I was driving to Wichita, which is not safe. And I don't recommend doing. Um, and so an, another last minute thing. So th those, those things have really, taught me a lot about myself and my ability to prepare on the fly and just man I've just I've been in the sport for 14 years you know like I've broadcasting is there are certain things about broadcasting that are still new and I'm still learning to some degree but MMA I know you know I, I I never fought in the octagon but I never really quit training either so I've been doing every aspect of this sport for 14 years you just haven't seen me competing and I never quit. I didn't quit MMA because I was bad at it either I quit because there was at the time no future in it and there's still kind of isn't if you're an atom weight that's a whole other discussion but right. um yeah so i just at the end of the day i was like man i know the sport i can do this and and for those that may not know about your backstory yes you didn't fight in the quote-unquote octagon tm but you did fight in invicta like you have competed before and that's why you yeah, a lot of amateur that. fights too yeah a lot of amateur fights that, don't, that aren't on my topology either i mean listen at the end of the day I, you know i'm not uh, I don't, I don't have a long and storied career to look back to, but the time spent in the gym, different gyms, you know, all the training partners in the world and talking about this sport from day one too. My, my first time covering MMA was back in 2010 when I was an amateur. I talked and I don't even remember the name of the blog. But I talked someone into someone that was connected with Titan FC and I said, Hey, if you get me a ticket to Titan FC, which was always in Kansas City at the time, and let me sit cage side, I will type out blow by blow recaps of the fights for your blog. And they're like, oh, cool. So I didn't get paid or anything. But so, I mean, this was like something I've been wanting to do since I was an, am you know, an amateur way back in 2010, watching you, huh. you know, on TV, watching you do your thing. And uh, I just, at the time, of course, I had no concept of what it could turn into 11 years later. Let me ask you this, because I, I would imagine there's someone at home who's just a fan and doesn't care about TV or broadcasting thinking this, you're on the pay-per-views now, you're backstage, you're interviewing people, you are a part of the UFC TV family, you're doing the weigh-in shows, you're kicking DC's ass, which I appreciate <laughs> and I, uh, I commend you for and uh, encourage you to do more. Why was being a color analyst for the fight such a big deal for you? Um, I think the best way to put it is that I, two things, first of all, 
uh, I, I, I deeply, deeply love the sport of MMA. That is first and foremost. And from the moment I started training, like, and anybody that's trained or been a part of the sport, you don't have to have trained on a sort of fought, but it, 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 like, it grabs a hold of you in a crazy way. And so when fighting was no longer really an option for me after I had my son and there just wasn't enough of a future for me to spend that much time away from him, being involved in the sport became everything that I ever wanted to do. And in couple with that, you know, as I, as I started to grow in these roles and really think about what do I actually want out of this, right? Because you can get in this rat race of just like more, 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 better, better, better. But like, what, what am I really after here? What, what is going to make me happy? And I sat down and, th and I thought long and hard about it. And what it kind of boiled down to for me was I don't want to be, I don't want to be, this is going to be a weird way to phrase it, but I don't want to be the pretty girl. I want to be the smart girl. I want to be, I want to be a voice a respected voice in this sport in whatever shape that takes. And to me, the ultimate goal was to be able to be a voice alongside and contributing with these amazing other analysts that I've been watching for so many years. Um, and it was never the idea of like, Oh, I'm better than them or I'm, you know, none of that, or I should take someone's place or it's, it's never been that attitude. It's like, um, I just love this sport so much. I have been in it so long. I've been all over to all these different gyms. I've trained with so many different people. And I love telling the stories of fighters. And I love talking about the action as it happens. And if I can contribute to the conversation, just be a part of it, be alongside it, not taking anyone's place, just be there, uh, then that's what I want to do. I want to I want to be able to contribute. Well, I would just add, uh, you are a respected voice already, whether or not you got this opportunity or not. Uh, no one says anything bad about you. You're very professional. You're very respectful towards everyone. You are um, someone who has, you know, some people come in and they're like a tour de force and they're like Tasmanian devils and they rub people the wrong way. You are not that person. I think you treat bloggers and media and 10 and 10 fighters and champions all the same. And so... I want to give you props for that because not everyone does that. Um, and I'm assuming that you want to keep, you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with this. You don't want to just be the contender series analyst, right? You want to be on the pay-per-views, right? <laughs> so what is the ultimate goal? Is it you want to be it's on such... the pay-per-views? You know, like, is that is that what we're going for here? Is that what we're doing? I listen, I'd be, I'd be lying to you if I said it wasn't. I'd be lying to you if I said anything different than that. Of course it is. Of course it is. That being said... I am trying very hard and I'm, I'm genuinely trying to soak in this moment and this accomplishment and what it meant to me, what it meant to other females who want to do similar things in this sport, whether it's commentating, reporting, whatever it is. And, and it's not, honestly, that was the other thing too. Like it's not, it's not about, it was cool to have that little nugget of history. That's, that was important to me, right? I think it's a very, it's a very natural part of human nature to want to leave something behind in this world, whether it's your children or uh, something that you made or something that you did, something that you accomplished, like legacy, I think is what we're all after, especially in sports to just have that little thing that no one can take away from you um, centuries from now. Right. And so like that, that, meant that meant a lot to me but yes the answer is yes <laughs> I'm, I'm never I'm unfortunately a naturally very competitive person I compete with myself first and foremost and so if there are any rungs higher on the ladder I'm gonna want to climb them up I'm just I'm just gonna want to but for now I'm thrilled and I'm happy to be to be calling fights in the contender but yes I do hope there's there's even more in the future and it's a really huge deal, again, for people that don't pay attention to this stuff. Like, let me tell you, for fight sports to have a female in there, it's a really, really huge deal. Um, you have broken through that that glass ceiling. And, you know, Doris Burke is revered in the world of basketball. She did the same. And you are on your way to being the Doris Burke of a man. And I think that's the biggest compliment that I could pay someone in your shoes. Did anyone reach out to you? I'm sure a lot of people reached out to you. But was there one message text, email, phone call that you got since yesterday that really uh, meant a lot to you? And maybe maybe there's too so many. many. Yeah. 
there, there, there are too many, but there actually is one person that I want to like call out in particular. I'm going to get choked up talking about it, but when I, uh, sorry to talk about it. when I started at Invicta, I essentially took half of Julie Kenzie's job away from her. Right. Like they, they called me to uh, have me do the in cage post fight interviews and basically said, Julie, you can still do the color commentary. And, but we want Laura to do everything that's on camera. And I was so excited, but I was like, I also was so, I felt a little bit guilty and nervous that, um, that she would be angry about that, you know? And I think at first, maybe it was a little bit hard for her, but she has always been incredibly kind. And then I would say like in the last, once I started doing commentary with her, and even before that, honestly, even when I was just doing more reporting stuff for Victor, like she has been the loudest, most vocal public supporter ever. And she was the one person who really shouldn't have been because I took part of her job away. And she has been banging this drum on Twitter for years and years and years. And it's it's because of people like her. Like she did commentary way before I did commentary. It was just she didn't get to do it uh, under the Zufa banner. There are lots of women that do commentary that have helped make this type of leaf for me possible you know lots of them i'm not the first color female color commentator i'm just the first under the first under the zufa banner and and props to kathy long as well like i kind of want to sit down and talk to her i'm I'm dying to know what that ufc one experience was like because it could it couldn't have been easy and then to not have her back you know i want i'm i'm kind of dying to know the behind the scenes story there i want to call her up but yeah, Julie Kedzie is, is one person in particular that I just, I feel like I have to I have to name. There are so, so, so many that I would like to name um, that we would, we would, I would just take up your whole show and it would be fair. But I, I do want to give one more little shout out and that is to you because I do know, I know you're not going to say it, but I know that there were a couple of key times when you went out of your way to say something nice about me to the right people at the right time, even when they were having you leave. My understanding is on the, on your way out, you said, you said, all right, you should check into this Laura Stanko girl. She's pretty good. So, you know, you're one of those people as well. And I appreciate it. But I'm, I'm a nightmare behind the scenes, Laura. Didn't, didn't you hear Brandon's <laughs> job? He said, I'm the worst. I'm the, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. That means a lot to me, Laura. That really does. I'm so, so happy for you. Um, I can't tell you how happy I am for you. It was really a great thing. And um, I hope that you get more opportunities, not just on Contender. And I kind of like, I, I, I'm sorry to say, I hope you don't get mad at me for saying, I kind of think it's awesome that you're doing all three of those jobs because it's not like, I'm not just going to break through this ceiling. I'm going to break through all this. I'm just going to yeah. do something that no one in TV does. And I'm going to do ring announcing and then I'm going to go back here. Well, let's be, let's be honest. Bruce, Bruce's job is very safe. Very, yes, very but I think it's kind of cool that you dominate <laughs> the entire Contender Series show uh, for the most part, along with yeah, the other guys yeah. there. So uh, get home to your family. Thank you so much for doing this on the side of the road, for goodness sake. I'm, I'm so happy you were able to call in for a few minutes. And again, congratulations. Enjoy this moment. Revel in it. Like, soak it all in. Digest it because we don't get these moments often in life where you get to actually say, I accomplished a goal. And then yeah. starting tomorrow, you go accomplish the next one. You go conquer the next one. And, and we all got your back. Right. Thank you, Ariel. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. All right. All the best. There she is, Laura Sanko, the newest color analyst for the UFC, uh, has been a part of the broadcast team for quite some time. Um, But as you can see, a tremendous human being with a great soul, a great heart, and uh, no one deserves it more. Honestly, no one deserves it more than she does. So really, really happy for her. And uh, kudos to the UFC brass. They deserve a lot of credit. Again, it's not always bad. They deserve a lot of credit. Everyone there, uh, from Dana to Craig Borsari to Zach Candido, and I'm sure there are other people involved, uh, they deserve a lot of credit for making those calls. And like I said earlier, for the broadcasters that they've brought up, like who thought Paul Felder would turn into this good of a broadcaster, right? Who thought that, uh, I mean, I, I think everyone thought this thing would be good. I think Chael would be really good in the uh, in the booth as well. I've said that. But anyway, really happy for her. Congratulations. And uh, hopefully 
she will be an inspiration to other young females who say, hey, you know what? I could do this too. Uh, I'm just going to rifle off a couple more of these before I say goodbye. Again, no show on Monday, so I'm giving you a little extra. Um, why is 267 on ESPN Plus without the usual pay-per-view charge? Afternoon card, those don't usually do well. Abu Dhabi, and then the next week's a pay-per-view in Madison Square Garden. And so, uh, you know, you can't do back-to-back -back pay per view Ariel, first off, it was awesome to see you on Showtime and doing the in-ring interviews. I was happy for you. My question, I know you are extremely cautious when it comes to COVID, but I'd like to know how you handled being around all those people during the Paul Woodley fight. Uh, are you just over it at this point? I am not. I actually went to go get a test yesterday just for peace of mind. I am negative. He. Um, but yeah, uh, I had to just kind of say this is an opportunity of a lifetime and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put it in the back of my brain and, and hope for the best. Now, anytime I wasn't on camera or talking behind a microphone, I had a mask on. And there were often times where I was around people who didn't have masks, their prerogative. But I just wanted to, and I told people like, I am going the extra mile to be safe because the last thing I would have crumbled had I, I mean, I don't know if I would ever recovered, been that close to a dream opportunity and, uh, you know, gotten sick or something happened. So I just wanted to be as cautious as possible and thank God all was good. But no, I'm not over it. I try to be very cautious. A lot of hand sanitizer. I wear masks as much as possible. And, uh, you know, I can't wait for this to all be over with. New York Rick, this is from Haynes. New York Rick, Corporate Jake, Tight Ship Troy. Characters we've all got to know and love. But what about this mysterious Frank guy? Ah, isn't it about time for a reveal? And how's your ukulele or ukulele going? I know you're a man of honor, but the promise of us hearing some sweet tunes on Instagram a couple months ago, you have yet to deliver. Damn, that hurts. Lastly, I want to send my deepest appreciation your way. I'm so proud of you, man. And I dare to say, see what I did here? We all are. We support you no matter what. Best regards from Sweden. Wow, what a nice message. Frank is the man. He's our new audio technician. Is that is that the right word, Frank? Audio engineer. Now, was that on the air or was that off the air? Like, can, Okay, you don't do on air. Uh, we'll get there. I'm a big guy. Again, I'm such a horrible human being that I like to have the people behind the scenes a part of the show. That's how New York Rick got involved. And there were other characters. Brendan back in the day. Josh in the early days. Joe in the early days, Corporate Jake, Tight Chip Troy. There were a lot of characters. I, I like to get the people involved. Um, you know, some people don't want to be involved. Some people are shy. But I like to give props and uh, shine a light. Uh, New York Rick liked to be on camera, uh, you know, being the, uh, the egomaniac that he is. Corporate Jake, not so much. Um, but we have a great team back there. We've got Alex. We've got Frank. We've got Yoon, and we've got Joe, who has stepped up tremendously for us. And there's a ton of other people working, Srinivas and, and, and Miles and people who aren't in New York. And soon we're going to have another member of the team join us, a young man named Connor. And it's so funny. He spells his name C-O-N-N-E-R, which is like the common mistake people make when trying to spell Connor McGregor's name. So I look forward to that. And uh, you'll be hearing from these people in the future. Make no mistake about it. For now, though, you should know. They help me out tremendously. Um, Arrow, do you think you have more live event opportunities for things like Woodley Paul? I hope so. I know you said if it was a one-off, you could still die happy. Facts, F-A-X, but you really crushed it. Thank you. Nothing right now, but hey, who knows? YOLO, why not? But yes, I would like it. Maybe I should be like Laura Sanko and be more open about it. It was a lot of fun. Um Ariel, it's an honor to have a forum to converse with you. My question, and it's a classic, where are we up to with the anti-eye poking gloves? Why is Dana so ignorant to the fact it is an issue? Yeah, I nothing at the moment. By the way, I didn't mention the ukulele working on it. Okay, I have had a lot going on. Um, but nothing, unfortunately, with the, uh, with the gloves. Daryl, the work you did with Showtime at the weekend, great, by the way, was that something you had been offered before but couldn't do due to ESPN or an opportunity that came up since you left? I was offered to be the post-fight interviewer for the Askren-Paul fight, and uh, they told me I couldn't do it. But, you know, they're, they're, I, I was bummed, obviously, but I was under contract, and that's part of the reason why I wanted to be sort of non-exclusive in this new era. Um, 
And if I can, across BT Sport and Showtime, I assume this was a very lucrative weekend. Uh, do you get any insight to the uplift in pay-per-view your work generates? As I think it's significant. Are you trying to say I deserve a pay-per-view cut? Pay-per-view points, Helwani? No. Not yet. But I was happy to be a part of it. Um, when are you going to upload a podcast to the Ariel Helwani show feed? And have you got any guests lined up? That's going to start after there's a couple of Jewish holidays coming up. So it doesn't really work out. So like mid to late September, that's going to start. I wanted to launch all these things. Everything starts smooth. And then we'll do the other thing where it's the non-MMA interviews that I'll be doing um, that have nothing to do with this world, like random people. I've got a bunch of people, a lot of guests in my mind that have nothing to do with the fight game, fight sports that I can't wait to talk to. Those will probably come out every Thursday. And uh, that there's a feed that's up already, the Ariel Hawani Show feed. And I'm really looking forward to that. And my YouTube Area Hawani. Uh, just a couple more here. <laughs> this is a good one. Aaron, I wonder if this is Aaron Cohen, my friend. After wearing that double-breasted suit jacket with jeans to the ceremonial weigh-ins, did David Helwani disavow you as a brother? I kid mostly. I thought that was a good look. A touch of class. Luke, if you're Woodley, would you set the... And, and shout out to my brother David. 20. Check him out. On Instagram, all the NBA players are wearing their clothes. Very exciting. New store opening up in Soho as well. Luke, if you're Woodley, would you get the tattoo to get the rematch and make X million dollars? Yeah, sure. Get the tattoo and then laser it off. Or just write something over it. Of course. No brainer. Uh, especially if you have a ton of tattoos. Last but not least, from the Pound town podcast ariel our podcast at pound town podcast twitter pound pound pod pound town podcast held our first interview last week with a regional fighter it was tough any suggestions or tips on how we can grow our interview skills yes i would say know who you're talking to don't write questions have a roadmap of where you want to go but be open-minded so that you can listen to the person. Because if you have a list of questions and it's like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and you're like, oh, this person's talking. And then like the last two words of their answer, they say something that's completely out of left field, outlandish. And you're thinking to yourself like, wow, you know, I'm thinking about question two. I wasn't paying attention to that. And now you've missed it. So have a, like, I don't write any questions down. I have nothing written in front of me, but I have uh, obvious, like I know that Cheeto Vera is fighting Frankie Edgar and he did that and this and that. So I, I have a sort of blueprint, a roadmap of where I want to go. And I just ask questions based off that. But mostly you have to listen because if you went to a coffee shop with a friend later today, you're not showing up with a list of questions. You're conversing. They're talking. You're asking a follow-up. You're talking. They're asking. Like that's how people talk, right? So I like to think of it more as a... Uh, conversation than a interview if you will and so i would say know who you're talking to know what you're talking about become sanskrit open-minded listen most importantly and then ask proper follow-ups all right thank you very much to everyone who asked questions uh we'll do it again next week i like this little segment it's fun i hope you do as well and thanks to all of you who tuned in again one more reminder no show on Monday because it's Labor Day here in the United States and Canada and probably other places. But then we're back on Wednesday, so a bit of a break. But I've given you a little more this week, if I'm being honest. All right? Don't get used to it. For now, though, we are out of time. The Mysterious Frank, I think that might be his new nickname. You know I like a good nickname. You can hit my music. Yeah. What a fun day it has been. By the way, what a great interview from one Laura Sanko. Oh, look at this. Now I see websites saying that I'm calling Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan is not jealous of me. Get the hell out of here with this nonsense. I never said he was jealous. I was saying it comes across that way when you're talking about jobs and things like that. Get out of here with this nonsense. These people are such hacks. You're hacks. Amazing. Anyway, you're welcome for the clicks. You're welcome. You're welcome for the traffic. 
Y'all know what I'm talking about. Much love. Thanks to all our guests. Thanks to everyone who has stopped by today. What a fun show. Uh, congratulations to Ricky Tertios, who won the Ultimate Fighter. We had a lot of bantamweights on today's show. Uh, what a great character. What a great guy. Thank you very much to Ally Quinta. Good luck to him, UFC 266. Thank you very much to Eric Nixick. And again, condolences, and I'm going to uh, tweet out that link as well. Thank you very much to Aljamain Sterling. Great to have him on. Thank you very much to Marlon Vera. And thank you to Laura Sanko, and congratulations to her as well. Back on Wednesday, same time and place. Until then, I say peace. I'm out of here.